um, it's it's from the early my early childhood where there was this, this cartoon show called Dark Wind Duck, and then the initials for that show um, logo was like DW. So my name has a D and a W in it, and like some of my friends decided, hey man, we love Dark Wind Duck. So you're that's Dark where like it's a cool show. That's where DW comes from. Um, yeah, so I uh, Kelly was my instructor, like he is for you guys. Uh, me and Rachel were in his cohort back in. Um, we started in like October twenty, no November twenty twenty one, and then we, fin- we ended up finishing that around February about February last year. And then, um, yeah, like I said, we, I was very lucky to have Rachel as a close co student and Kelly as a instructor. And, like. Rachel was both did really well. We were either top two or top three in the class. And Kelly got a position for uh, to do the same thing that he's doing now, but at Kingsville Community College. And he um, you know, he tapped me and Rachel and was like, hey, you guys are awesome. I have two people in class and this is the third. I want you guys to come to TA. And me and Rachel TA for Kelly over at Kingsboro. Two. There was two cohorts right up. Yeah, there's two. MIC yeah, one and, and two. Yes. And, uh, so we did that, and that was pretty awesome. Um, and then we got called back to do it for generation at that time. So um, this time we weren't the same cohort because I actually started before Kelly. Mm-hmm. I started maybe three months ago. Kelly just started like, three weeks ago or something like that. Or month ago. No, it was like, hey, we're in week seven. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Nice. All right. <laughs> time flies. So you guys are almost done. Five more weeks. Yeah. So, yeah, pretty close. So I think we have we have total thirteen weeks. So yeah, six weeks. Yeah. So, but yeah, man, I, I I I can't tell you guys how lucky you are. Ab Kelly, he's an amazing instructor. He, um, uh, he he's taught me everything I know. Uh, Lies. And uh, he kind of like showed me what um what like education as an adult can be. You know, non traditional education, and because of that. I actually went back to traditional education and I'm like working on my, on finishing my bachelor. I'm very close. I could be done like within the next year. And awesome. um, he, you know, brought out this passion for, for technology. I mean, that was always there, but like, because, you know, him and, and his other instructors at the time were so um, open with, it, with their own knowledge and with, with their own support. Like, it just like, me, led me to uh, get more into the subject. Like, subject. But anyway, I, that's just telling you where I come from. So you guys know that I was the same. And now I'm um, going to be talking about uh, some pretty useful uh, script uh, support tools, um, those being uh, low access and scripting. And we'll also talk a little bit about data, uh, backing up our data. Um, so, yeah, so let's get started with that. Um, so, this is part of the uh, 220 through 102 uh, exam. So, like, the, usually people do the 1001 first and then take the 1002. So, this is going to be part of the second core. Um, so, our objectives for today would be um, learn, uh, learning about remote access, when to use it, um, their the protocols, then implementing a backup recovery plan. And, and then finally, we'll it's been a good amount of time talking about uh, scripting, the basics of it, uh, use cases for it. You're recording, right, Kyle? You are now. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, actually, so feel free to raise your hand if you have questions or drop it in chat. And if I miss it in chat, just, um, just please uh, bring it to my attention. Here. Do you have another team for them, Kelly? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, we have Rachel and Terrence here. All right. Hi, Terrence. Terrence comes from doing? the cloud side, so he brings a very new perspective about it. Oh, awesome. Hey. What's going on? Uh, all right. So, so my questions are to, are to the class. What do you guys, what do you guys know about remote access? Can anybody like tell me in their own words, either in chat or come off mute? And tell me what you what what you know remote access to be or what you think. Uh, remote access 
Uh, what I know about it is like promoting into like somebody's computer or like help them troubleshoot like issues. Okay, so from that perspective, that that's that's really good. But I want you to define it or give me an, a, an example without using the word. So tell me like um, what's actually going on with your remote or something. Um, aren't you connect? Aren't you connecting to someone's computer and like you're basically having all access and as if you were actually there using the computer okay okay this yeah that's pretty that's pretty good that's what i was trying to get to right so yeah i see it in the chat too so to log in from afar all right so when we're doing a remote access we're typically logging in over the network and basically what i want you guys to remember is remote access it's yes you have access to someone's um physical computer without actually physically being so you're you're at you're, you have access to the entire system remote over the network. So yes, that is what remote access. Is. And so um, as you can imagine, given that you have that you're being granted access over someone's system, whether it's in a professional environment, it's in uh, like a home like a home user and you work at a call center or something. Um, there are some very like uh, strict considerations that you have to take into that, especially with security. So um, first of all, you know, you have to um, request permission, right? You have to explain. Okay. Uh, so you need to request permission, um, right? Uh, yeah, like you, if you're, um, if, if you're troubleshooting with someone, and you feel like you need remote access, you need to tell them, hey, um, you know, I, you know, or this isn't working, I might have to do a more hands-on approach. Um, there's this tool that we could use, it's, uh, whatever your tool is, it'll grant me access. To you. But you need to you know, be vocal about that, actually explain what that means. You have. You know, they're not gonna be able to move their mouse, um, they're gonna see things opening without them actually doing those things, right? And then also what, once, once you've done that, you need to walk them through every step, that you're doing, like, hey, going into your Windows folder, I'm going to open up such such and such file. Then we're going to troubleshoot that application again, and you know, just let let them know what you're doing through every step. While you're while you're in someone's system, you don't want to snoop around. If you're if you're there to help with Zoom, you probably shouldn't be in their pictures folder. Um, if you're there to um, you know troubleshoot a printer, you probably shouldn't be going through their other application. Um, and then uh, at the same time, there might be, you might come across things that are very personal, right? You shouldn't discuss those with other people. Uh, you, again, you shouldn't go out of your way for things uh, that are private. Uh, so we, we have a couple of different ways to act to use remote desktop. So, uh, remote desktop protocol was uh, is a is a networking protocol that was designed by Microsoft. It uses port uh, 3389, and um, what it does is it allows encrypted session uh, remote access from client to to a host. Uh, again, that uses uh, port 3389, and this is uh, this was a Microsoft developed uh, protocol. Then uh, we have we have something similar for for Mac. It's called VNC, or virtual network computing. And this allows things for like screen sharing, file sharing over um, uh, from, from from Mac users, and it uses uh, TCP port fifty nine. So if you guys notice, both of these ports are TCP. You guys remember what TCP stands for? Transmission Control Protocol. Perfect, right? So, um, what's 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 cool about TCP? Why why do you guys think we would use it for for something like this? Uh, it's TCP is like one of the main platforms that um is alongside with IP, like that is used to get information from one computer from their network over to your network and to your computer. Yeah, so so there are predominantly two types of ports, right? So there's UDP ports, 
user datagram um, ports, and then there's uh, TCP ports, transmission control. But there's there's a there's a specific um, there's something specific about TCP that we would use it for something like remote desktop. The three way handshake. Yes. Well, that's yeah. So the three way handshake is a connection based protocol, meaning it establishes establishes and maintains a connection. Um, so that's why we use like all our RDP ports. Are um, so yeah, that's really good. Awesome. Good job, guys. So yeah, wait, you guys were awake when Kelly was going over networking or was it Rachel? I take no credit. <laughs> All right, awesome. Okay, so um, so our RDP server would be uh, something that, that that is set up, right, as a, uh, something that provide remote desktop services. And again, you, you can set up things uh, like security options, like which accounts are allowed to connect. You can, you can, so you can set up uh, those authentications at a network level, which is what uh, NLA stands for. And then the RDP restricted admin mode, remote credential guards. That's that's kind of again. So like uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote. Um, I, well, I'm not gonna quote. This is, has nothing to do with tech, but I'm sure some of you guys are movie fans or comic fans. What did Ben say um, to, uh, to Spider Man right before he died? What did Uncle Ben tell Spider Man? Tori had it. Huh? You should, well, you should. I said, no, I said Jatoria had it. She said it. Oh, she did? I'm sorry. <laughs> say it again. Power, I had it. Come with, with great responsibilities. Yes. So great power comes with great responsibility. So even even like uh, even for the text that you know, the people who are using remote access, right? There's certain certain things that we don't that we shouldn't be allowed to see, right? Even if we're working in IT, we probably shouldn't know, you know, like super uh, confidential stuff, like people's salaries and things like that. So even in our in like our remote desktop servers, there's things called like restricted admin, which is like yeah, you got admin access to do certain things, but even you as an admin don't have access to view whatever is restricted on the server. And that's where re, uh, restricted admin mode comes in. It guards, it guards like super, you know, super secret things from, you know, from us, because, you know, there's certain things that we shouldn't have access to, right? Uh, and then the last thing that we need to be aware of is that there are some open source RDP servers, and they're not, as, you know, they're not as popular as, as the ones that I actually went over, but they do, you know, you might wanna, you know, just do a little bit of research if you're interested in that. Uh, you'll find a couple. Of okay, so Microsoft Remote Assistance. So this is a pretty useful tool that is built into all Microsoft, um, all Microsoft uh, PCs with Windows 10 or under. Um, and well, now and but now it's called Quick Assist. So if you guys don't believe me, go ahead and. And in, if you have a Microsoft system, type in Quick Assist into your search box. Actually, I'll do it here too. Okay, so you should get this little applet. Um, I don't know why it's not fully loaded. Let's try it. Being lazy to run. Okay, so yeah, so if you do that and you type it in, you'll get something like this. And what, what this is, is like, it's a built-in uh, remote access uh, little app that allows you to chat with someone to get to help you. I'm not saying it's, it, it, and it's not gonna be a professional, right? It's, it's just gonna, let's say, um, let's say I have an issue and I need I need someone to walk me through it. I can, you know, I can message Kelly and be like, hey, Kelly, open, you know, dust off your old Windows PC and um, I can generate a code give it to him and you'll be able to go or vice versa. If I need his help from, from Rachel, I could do the same thing. If Rachel needs help from me. And it's a way that we can um, we we can give and receive remote uh, remote connection. And basically what you do is you either say I'm here to help someone, right? And then um, and then I would share this code with whoever I'm trying to help. This is what that's how we can do that. Um, Someone would type that in 
and then based because this is the credentials, uh, when the other person authenticates, then um, uh, Quickasys will go ahead and, and establish that remote connection. Okay, it also has features like a chat. Um, it has another feature where you can request for control or you can just take it back. And again, this comes standard. Has anyone ever used Quickasys? I, I may be preaching to the choir. I know a lot of scammers use it. Quick assist. The, I think yeah. the quick assist is harder than to use in the other ones. So there are there the 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 wind link the windows links to like oh, I'm gonna give you a website to go to. Well, always be careful who you. Yeah, I know any desk is very, very popular for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be careful of everything. Here. Have you gone through security with them yet? Have you scared the computers out of them? <laughs> we were going over security this week. Oh, okay. So you have okay. so you get, uh, Kelly's favorite topic: security. Don't trust anyone. <laughs> Your mom sends you an email. Scan it. <laughs> no, just put it in junk. <laughs> <laughs> if it's All important, right. she'll call. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to talk about some specific protocols that these uh, uh, remote applications use. So uh, SSH. What port number does SSH use, guys? I forgot. 22. 22. All right. And uh, SSH stands for? Secure shell. Secure shell. All right. And then the last question is secure shell secure. Everyone always answers the first two, but then it takes a little while, right, for the third. It's not a trick question, guys. It's uh, secure shell secure. Yes. Yes. All right. Cool. Good job. <laughs> All right. So secure shell. Uh, so secure shell is a, a text a text based uh, command line uh, remote access protocol. Uh, that you know, it's a fancy way to, of saying yeah, you have access to someone's uh, system all over the command line. Uh, but what's awesome about uh, SSH is that um, it is secure, right? So it uses um, it uses public key uh, authentication, which is actually pretty good. Um, and, and because of this, um, this tends to be a very, a very um, popular port for, for remote um, access. Uh, there is another one in our well-known ports called Telnet. You guys know which number is Telnet? 23. 23, good. Um, 23, and like Secure Shell, Telnet is also a, a text-based uh, command line remote access protocol. The only thing is that um, Telnet is not secure. Uh, Telnet is, is what we call um, oh, um, I'm sorry. In plain text, in plain text, yes. Yeah. So Telnet is what we call in plain text, meaning that if someone uh, is able to interfere with your connection, like uh, if you are, if someone is able to get into your connection, then they they will just be able to read everything. That's it. Um, it's not encrypted at all. So um, for that reason, it tends to not be used. I mean, I feel like it's a good reason. But with that being said, there are some like, cases where it may be used. But typically speaking, we, we probably, and it's for that reason we use this. All right. So, um, all right. So now that we kind of like talked about um, the remote flex um, protocols, uh, what what do you guys think are some case uses for this? I'm sorry, if you could repeat the last part. Sure, what would, we, what, what would we use things like remote access? What do you guys think? Troubleshooting. Troubleshooting, yes. Um, file sh like sharing documents for like presentations. Um, say it again? Like to see like shared documents. To see shared documents, okay. Um, 
maybe to support with that, yes. Um, remember, uh, so I'm, I'm talking about specifically like um, giving granting access to your system. So you know what I mean? Onboarding? Uh, maybe for onboarding, yeah. And then if you have to work walk someone through um, a, a particular um, situation, yeah. But uh, okay, so let's say that, uh, let's say that you, you guys are working at a call center and I call, I call in, right? And, hey, um, you know, I typically work with two monitors and uh, for some reason today, my sec my backup monitor is, isn't working. Um, would you, would your first suggestion be to establish a remote connection so you can set that up for me? Or are there other things that we should do before that? I would say try to help the person with the issue first, kind of like use the remote as like a last resort. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So that's what I want to want to say, right? Like, don't don't, um, especially in in, a, in an instance where you are um, providing like technical support to um, to people outside outside the company, or yeah, uh, walk walk through the steps, right? You know, the first thing could the first thing you should probably ask me is, "Yo, is your monitor turned on?" I'm not kidding. That's the probably that's the first thing, like. You know, but is um, are you in the correct input um, mode? It, is your monitor connected on both ends? Like those are that's probably the thing. You know, you got to start with the obvious first, and then even even after that, like something remote support would probably be like fifth or sixth down the line for me, right? Like it's not gonna it, it would be like I would go with the obvious the simplest solution first, and then I would also gauge if the person is able to because because if it's Kelly, I probably don't need. I probably don't need to remote into the system to help Kelly out because right? he's he's versed in technology. Same thing with Rachel. Now, if it's like my mom, right, who doesn't know what the power button is, but that's going to be a long call. And eventually, I might have to remote that stuff. So um, definitely use your um, uh, your two cents when doing this. Uh, but again, uh, it, it becomes pretty. Uh, I don't want to say easy, but it, it, it should become like common sense. Like you should use this tool. So um, we still have to talk about uh, DM, the, the desktop management and RMM. And these are uh, these are tools that, that are used by like um, MSPs. Have, do you guys know what an MSP is? Hey, what happened to my camera? I, I think you might have turned it off to save bandwidth because your voice was a little choppy in the beginning, but it's doing really good now. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So we'll leave it off. Then. No one needs to see my mug anyway. You got, you got your catfishing picture up, so you're good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it is my cat. <laughs> uh, what are we doing? What, is, what was my question, guys? I forgot my questions. Does anyone know what an MSP is? Manage that All right, awesome. Yeah, good job. Whoever said it in um, once that came off mute and Katie in the chat. Right? So, a managed service provider. Managed service providers are people who manage your your IT for you, right? Like, let's say, let's say you're a small business and you can't afford to have an IT department, so you go out and outsource that to an MSP, and they take care uh, of your IT needs. So. They have these uh, tools called R uh, RMMs, which is a remote monitoring and management tools. And through that, um, they also establish UEM, which is Unified Endpoint Management. And basically this means, uh, so uh, uh, Endpoint is a, is a host, like it's, it's another, you know, it's another term for the, the user. So it's pretty much a unified like user. So, RM combines those two. And what it does is it grants things over remote connections to like do security scanning, push push updates, push um, uh, deployments, remote support, um, even things like um, um, performance monitoring, lock collection, all, you know, all these things are able to be done over RM. And, and you, you know, this comes to be very important, right? Because if you're an MSP who probably has, let's say you're a good MSP and you got hundreds of clients, 
right? And each one of those clients has hundreds of employees, or something like that. Um, then you would need efficient software to be able to actually keep track of their IT assets and their users. And this is where on are. Um, and then the last thing here that that, um, that that we see the Intel V Pro and the AMD Pro hardware support for out of band or AOB remote access. This is something that's built directly into the Intel processors and the AMD processors. Um, and these are like their um, these are like their their nice processors, right? Like their uh, like their industry leading processors. And basically, this allows uh, <clears throat> this allows those systems to be uh, to have remote access to Intel and to AMD for like advanced support. This isn't this isn't something that is needed. Whoops, I could drop the presentation. Yeah, so that last bulletin is not going to be on the top. It's just it's good to know if you have ten calls. Okay, and then so. Some people were, were talking about file sharing and like cloud and stuff like, not cloud, sorry, file sharing and like video. And technically those are remote access tools. So we're using one right now, which is Zoom, right? Like you guys are able to see screen over um, the network. So you have some type of remote access to my system, right? Because it's actually what I'm seeing that you guys are following along with. And even, even so, um, Zoom has this feature built in that can like ask you to grant me uh, remote access and then I will be able to take control of you. And sometimes we use this for troubleshooting with our students, um, especially in the beginning, if we need something and we tried a couple of times and I walk you through it, then we'll we'll ask for like a remote access so that way we can we can show you how to how to get get to where we need to go. And um, so, is Rachel? Are you there? Can I ask you to grant to ask for um, ask for remote access for me? Uh, or, or you, Kelly? Whoever's whoever. Yeah. What do you need? Um, can you ask for remote access? So go to like the new go to share and then. And there should be something that says ask for remote access or click on my name. And ask. There's a couple is this, of different ways. Is this in Zoom or? Yeah, this is in Zoom. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you haven't used it yet? Oh, good. So you get to, you get to experience it. So I think if you go to like my part, to participants and like right click. Oh, okay. Kelly's doing it. So Kelly, so you guys can't see it. but So this is the uh, notification. Kelly's requesting remote control of your screen. And um, sure, I'll approve them. And then, so these are, these are my hands. Kelly, why don't you go to the next slide? All right. Uh, okay, that's that's good. Go to the next one. Ten slide ten. But uh, if you look at the top of the screen, you can see, or you should be able to see. Uh, do they see it in yellow, or is that just my screen? No, nah, that's just your screen because you're going right. control. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, so Kelly's Kelly's the one controlling the system. All right, Kelly. Um, how do I get my stuff back? <laughs> uh, I will stop remote. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So yeah. So um, if you're ever in a pinch. And you have a Zoom account, and you forgot about Quick Assist, or the person who doesn't have Quick Assist. Because Kelly, you're on your Mac, yeah? Yes, sir. So Kelly's on his Mac, and I'm on a Windows, and we were able to use Zoom for that. So there's some another nice little tool to keep you know, handy, and a lot of other video conferencing, <clears throat> a lot of other video conferencing softwares do do these. Like I know uh, Skype has something like that. Which one's the Google one? Google. Meets, Google Meets has something like that. So yeah. Um, then there's things like uh, file transfer software, um, things like Apple AirDrop, uh, nearby sharing, Android nearby sharing. Those um, those are also considered remote access tools. 
And finally, uh, last thing I want to talk about is virtual uh, virtual private network. So someone remind me, please, because um, you know I tend to forget these things. Uh, what exactly is a VPN? Could someone describe it to me? So what? A VPN, this thing right here. A virtual private network. Yeah, can you tell me what in your own words what that is. Um. Well, sure. Okay. VPN is a tool that you could use to kind of mask, like kind of like put on a mask of your where your IP is. So like you you being in your house, you can say you can make your computer present itself having an IP of your office or you can access office tools if it's if the security in office is it only wants people to access using that specific IP. Okay, so you it, it you can use it for um, IP masking, but there's a so so you kind of headed headed there, right? Um, so a, a virtual private network is um, you you it has let's say picture a tunnel, right? And um, with with endpoints, right? So you have. Your computer as one endpoint. Let's let's keep it um, for a business purpose, right? So let, let's use uh, our home computer as one network, and then our office network as the other thing, right? So this is these are the endpoints. When you start a VPN, what you're doing is that you're starting kind of like an encrypted tunnel between those two points, right? And then all the information that's sent through this tunnel is encrypted and it's very it's usually very high encryption right because um uh, when, when we're accessing our professional network through here all our data we, we need it to be protected from evil doers outside so we we use a uh, pretty good encryption even for the most basic vpns and then the very high-end vpn use very very good so it's kind of it's really hard to kind of like crack that encryption get access to, to that. So um so that's what a, a virtual private network. But you were headed on the right track. Um but it's you know some people use it for things like um uh, like getting a different IP address. But it, it's it's a little bit more than that in the in the professional side. So I want you to think about it as uh, kind of like that like a uh, encrypted tunnel between two points. Um, right and you know and the good the good What's good about that is that for remote access, it's perfect. Because, you know, we're 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 doing things like taking 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 control of systems. Like, um, um, like I recently just uh, I recently just updated to to Windows uh, to the Windows Ten Pro, right? And I I and I finally downloaded Windows Eleven. I just I'm I'm waiting for my school semester to be over so I can finally update it, but um, part of, part of the reason for that is because um, now I'll be able to do things like because Windows only has their Pro or better operating systems, and then basically I could take my um, I have a nice little surface, and I could just instead of carrying my big old you know thirty five pound laptop everywhere, I could carry my surface, and I could just remote at, via VPN into into my system anywhere that I'm in. To all my things on, you know, it's pretty cool, and I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, so that's um, that's kind of like the, the the quick like one sentence definition of the VPN. It's like an encrypted tunnel um, that connects a client to a private network, um, you know, over over an encrypted uh, link. Is that would you? Is that how you describe it, Kelly? I don't want to step on your toes. No, that's about right. All right. About right, not one hundred percent. You can never get. I mean, it it's right. you know, yeah, it's it's communicating over an encrypted tunnel, and it can unlock regionally locked access. Um, yeah, thank you. Regionally locked material. Kelly so, uses it for his um, uh, uh, what is it? Attack on Titan? Are you like on season seven now? Dude, I'm. I have not even had a chance to watch it. I'm still in season two. Okay, so I, I don't feel that bad. I'm there. So. <laughs> all right all right so that kind of like brings us to the end of uh, remote access is you know it's 
kind of like pretty straightforward. We talked about the different tools. Uh, our, we talked about RDP. Uh, so Microsoft Remote Assistance, which is not quick assist, uh, Secure Shell, Telnet, um, and then RMMs, and then other remote access tools like video conferencing, file sharing, and VPN. You guys have any questions for me about this stuff? Yeah, you said um, RDP uh, with Microsoft. You, did you say it needs Windows 10 or 11? No, no, no. So RDP was uh, is an old uh, is an old port. It's just what was developed by them. So they they use this port 3389. That's and that's the that's the protocol. Yeah. Oh. Okay. No. What I what I said was about Windows 10 was quick assist. So. So Quick Assist comes uh, with, with Windows 10 and, and higher, like already in the system. So if you have a Windows oh. 10 PC, you can try this out. Just type in Quick Assist and it should pop up. Does that mean the computer you're trying to remote into would have to be Windows 10 too or up? Um, no, if they have Quick Assist on there, then. Um, so typically what, what would happen is you would ask someone what, what Windows they have, and they have Windows 10, you know that Windows is there. If they don't, then they have the other one, which is the predecessor to it, which is remote uh, Windows Remote Access Assistance. And then you could find a different one to do that either by. It, it, I don't know if the two mesh well. I haven't tried it. That's actually a good question. Thank I can you. look into it. And let you know. any, any other questions there? Yes. Okay, so there's no other questions while I look that up. Um, so we can we can talk about the second the second topic today, which is uh, implement, implementing backups and recovery. Okay, so what's a backup? Let's get some consensus for what a backup. This is a straightforward one, you guys. A copy of all your data stored somewhere else so you can get back to it if something happens. Okay, that's pretty good. There was one more, there was like one little component that I, that I would want there and, uh, and we'll define that as a working copy, right? Because you want things that you can work with. But yeah, that was pretty good. So yeah, so it's like a, a backup is a you know a working copy of data that um, that would allow you to continue working in case of something happening to your production. So production is what we what we're going to use as as a term for the data that we're currently using. So um, right, so think about like like right now, um, my production data would be everything on my laptop. Right? That's that's all the that's all the files. All the files and, and resources that I that I need to, to to work right now, and then my backup data is everything that I have in my external S. You know, you know, I usually back that up like a week or something like that. Um, sometimes uh, I get lazy and I need to do like two weeks. I, you know, I'm not like Kelly. Kelly is famous for his backup protocols even before <laughs> he was a uh, a teaching instructor. Teaching instructor. So yeah. Um, so it, it's very important, for, especially in a professional environment, that we are able um, to recover from situations where we lose data, right? Because data tends to, I'll just say, it, data is like the most important thing for a company, yeah. especially if you're doing production, sales, um, if you're man if you're managing accounts, finance, like every like. The world is built on data today. No, there's no ifs and ends about it. Like the world runs on data. So it's it's important that we have um, working um, reliable backups for all of our data. So we're gonna talk about that process, what it looks like from an IT perspective, and then Windows tools for like our personal data backups, like file history and like uh, Windows backup and restore 
So, um, so backup methods. So there's there's three different uh, uh, methods that we like to talk about, uh, which is a full backup. So a full backup is kind of exactly what it says. You're you're taking uh, you're taking uh, all your data and you're literally making a copy of all of it. Right? Um, and beca because because um, because you're doing all the data, this tends to be um, the highest like the, the highest uh, time and storage um, demand, meaning that it takes the longest time to back up that data to make that copy, and it takes up the most space, right? Um, but then recovering, like let's say something happens and you need to recover, um, then recovering from a full backup is actually the easiest one in terms of uh, complexity, and um, and it's also the fastest one to get. So while while backing it up is the longest and it takes the most space, recovering from it is the simplest and fastest one. Um, the next the next uh, data uh, uh, backup method would be incremental, and what happens here is that any new files or files that have been modified since the, since your last backup job, um, those will be the ones to get to 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 get back. So like let's say. So today I worked on this file here, the copy of whatever the title is here, copy of 2.220.11.02.19. So since I made changes on this, this would be the only thing to be backed up, right? From, from the last time that I did. Um, so this was actually the fastest one to, to back up because again, you're only, you're only saving the file that you're that you, that you worked on or new files since the last backup. But then it to recover from it, it, it actually has the highest numbers. And it'll take you the longest time to recover. Because what happens is the system needs to go back to each incremental backup and kind of like work backwards. So and then so so you take you you take the uh, you take the benefits on the on the initial backing up of your data, but then um, when it's time to recover, it's not. it's the opposite. It takes a lot, a lot longer because you have all these incremental backups that you can put together. Backup. And then the last one will be the differential backup. And these are this would save all files or files modified since your last full backup. So um so basically this would look at the last time that you did a whole system backup and then change and then save everything that's been changed since then. Right. Um, and then this one is in between in terms of uh, your your copy time and your backup time. So it's moderate for both. Um, and then the different the thing is that if you're doing incremental backups, you can switch and then start doing differential backups. So you you have to Okay. So you have to like pick a pick a side. Yeah, go ahead. Someone need it. I was about to say what what does it mean by clear and not clear? So I'm actually not sure about the archive attribute. Can you help me out? This archive With attribute. To cleared um, and not cleared. Yeah. That's a good question, honestly. Yeah, I don't. Give me a second. Oh, wow. I can consult my coworker. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It is what it says it is. Okay. So basically, um, what happens is, is it's an archive attribute. So when um, it's what it's going to do with the old copy once the new copy is created. So if it's going to be erasing and getting rid of the old copy, it's going to be cleared. So once new copy is created, old copy is cleared. Oh, okay. And if it's not and cleared, then the old copy is not changed. cleared basically means as the as new copy comes in, the old copy is not cleared. So it's not erased. Okay. So if you, so uh, so I had a full backup right last month and now I'm making another full backup this month. 
So once it's done, it takes my backup from last month and clears it out. Is that what we're going with? Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, that makes sense. All right, awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I thought it was something around those ones. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, guys. Water. <laughs> Iced tea. <laughs> It's the only thing next to me. There you go. All right. Okay. So, um, so as you guys know, we have different storage medias, and um, so one that's very, uh, it's kind of like a grandfathered one, but it's still it's still used, especially for, in, like critical data is uh, tape drives. Or if you use the Kahoot that we did at 3 a.m., tap drive. Oh, uh, you see, I was, I was just gonna mess with you right now. <laughs> yeah, tape drives, not tap drives. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so tap uh, tape drives. Uh, and basically these are the, um, these, this is kind of this, this technology that was used when when uh, computers used to be mainframes, right? Um, so computers, you know, computers used to be the size of a whole office, right? Like they would be huge, and um, and we would we would take these big uh, drive magnetic, magnetic tapes, and uh, we would, this is how we would store our data. We would put it in a machine, the machine would go ahead and make little dots across across the tape. As, as the tape is being put in. And then when you needed to read or write something, you would have to search the tape for the files that you need. So uh, again, these, these, tape, these tape drives are, are older technology, right? They've been upgraded to like uh, be a little faster, to integrate with new, <laughs> with new technology, but, they, but they, the concept is still the same as it was back in the 50s. Um, and so this, this, uh, these tape drives are sequential, but they are very durable. They tend to have the longest lifespan. That we have. Um, and then, so that's when the one thing that I want you guys to be familiar with is tape drives that we use today. Um, and then we have different, you know, media for storage. So we have things like SSDs, right? Uh, we have things like eight, um, HDDs, we have things like um, DVDs, Blu-rays, all these things are considered you know, uh, viable you know, backup media. Because the thing is that you want to have, um, you, have you want to have, so, so the rule of thumb is three, two, and one. So you need to have three copies, of three working copies, right? Uh, two in different media types and then one completely off-site in, in a different location. So you wanna have three working copies, at least two of them have to be in different medias, and then one has to be in a, in a different location. And um, so what a lot of companies do is that they'll hire like a cloud, um, a, a, a cloud uh, expert and have them um, make a copy of their System in or all their data in a, in a in a cloud environment that is probably, that is stored somewhere else geographically from where they're at, and that kind of like covers um, the in a in a different location in a different media. because even even though it's um it's in the cloud, it's usually in a you know it's in a data center somewhere, right? Like we, we know that that's what the cloud is. The cloud is just an infrastructure of uh, hardware that we're able to access. With Internet, usually, you know, in a remote site somewhere. So, so that would cover two, two of those, and then we would have like a physical backup somewhere on premises where we can we can back up if something happens to our system there. Um, and that's kind of um, so. The other two things will be um, so that covers offsite and insite. So onsite is anything premises. And typically, when you're doing offsite, you're doing again somewhere um, in a different location, just in case there is like a, a 
um, local okay. disasters. Yeah. We'll get into hot, warm, and cold sites later. Okay. Yeah. And then online versus offline. So an online backup means that if something were to happen, um, you can you can back up immediately, ready to go. Like you have it ready to go. Offline means that it's you know you would have some setup to to do it. And that kind of would go with like hard and hot swappable, um, right? So hot swappable means that take a component, plug it into a computer system without turning it off, turn it back on. And um, where warm swappable, you either have to like uh, suspend the system, um, yeah, like suspend it or hibernate it. And then cold swappable means you have to shut down the system. It's kind of like the same thing. So online is ready to go, where offline is you need some, you need other steps in between before you can actually start backing up. And then, so have you guys ever, um, uh, like, have you guys ever like taken notes and then realized that the notes you're taking are terrible because the person who took them didn't take the notes? So it's kind of the same thing with backup. Uh, you want to test the data that you're backing up. So you want to want to make sure that all the files that you need are there, that there was no corruption in the backup uh, process. Because if you don't do that and something happens and there was a corruption in your backup, and it's time to you know to to go get that data and back up from it, and you're not able to, you're gonna have some explanation. So always um, test your your, your backups. Uh, Verify. Always look at the things that you're storing your backups in to make sure that they're not they're not about to fail. Like if you're working on a RAID, you know, if your system uses like a, a RAID NAS or something like that, and two of the drives are blinking that they might fail, and you fail to address that, right? Um, you you know, don't be surprised that you're not able to to, to work 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 with that data. So that's what we mean by needed integrity. Make sure that whatever data you're using, whatever you're storing your data in, um, it looks like it's uh, meeting the requirements. So. And then finally, when you do, so when you, when you're when you're testing your recovery process, make sure that uh, that files are going to the places you need to, and that all your files. We kind of went through that. Now with our on um, with the generation to skill force, like we had a big shared drive that was nice organized. And then when that data was backed up and migrated over to systems, all our files are all over the place, extremely hard to find anything. And I'm still missing some things that I'm pretty salty about. But hey, what can you do? And then again, just frequently test all your data your backups. We have um, a saying which goes, it's more of like a a programming saying, but basically garbage in. So if you, if you give a computer garbage, you can expect, expect uh, garbage back. It's kind of the same thing with your data. If you're, if you're saving garbage, that's that's what you're going to have. When it's not to back up. All right, so uh, this brings us to the end of our backup and recovery. Is there anything you guys you wanted to add, Kevin? Anything I missed here that you want to touch up on? No, I mean, so this was a little bit of a review, which is awesome. Oh, you guys did this already. We did the uh, differential, full, and incremental. Oh, okay. Uh, we didn't really get into the testing and all that stuff, which is awesome. All right, awesome. Okay, well, so how about so that? That brings us to the beginning of the scripting class. How about we take a quick uh, five minutes and then we'll, we'll meet back here at, at 10, 1031. So that way I can execute five. What is, what this, so what this does is it allows you to write and execute Python code online without having to download an interpreter. And uh, we're not going to use it right now. We're going to use it um, to interpret. Uh, open it and just have it. And once you've done that, um, just uh, just click the plus sign to open up. 
But um, yeah, so let's get back to the lesson here. So again, so we're gonna um, identify the basics of scripting. We're gonna talk about some use cases, and um, but we can't talk about something without first kind of understanding what it is or like what we mean when we talk. About. So I need your help, guys. I need to. Um, I want to identify kind of like what you guys consider scripting or what you may think it is. And then I'll tell you how we use it. And then hopefully that'll give you a better understanding of exactly what scripting is. So who could tell me what, what they think about when scripting comes into um, discussion? I mean like scripting is something like a code language? A code language, okay. All right. And um Let's get some other people in here. We'll, we'll, uh, it's going to be hard to, for one person to get the entire definition. So, but usually what I what, what I try to get from this is like together we can make it into a a scripting front end. Is it like bits and pieces of um, information where they blocked it together? Bits and pieces of information. Um, scripting is you writing code to perform. Computer science, like programs. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. That's that's pretty good. So yeah. So so scripting is writing a usually small amount of instructions that a computer can perform. And you said code, right? A lot of a lot of you guys said code, and that's pr pretty what that's kind of like what uh, code is. It's instructions. Is it like creating small programs? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, so you guys kind of like defined it. So yeah. So a, a script, uh, like think about um, a movie script, right? A script is a list of instructions whether it's lines for the actors to say, whether it's where to walk on the stage, whether it's what lighting needs to come on, uh, what kind of expressions they have, like that's all what goes on the script, right? And it, and it's at the, the, the purpose of the script is for a certain outcome to, to, to take place. And that's kind of the same thing in IT, right? Like, so we we take like, uh, um, Andrew, it was Andrew said, who says, um, we, we take small pieces of code and we expect a, a certain outcome out of it right but at the same time a script technically is a small program too so you guys were both right about that um so yeah so a script is taking some and you know, uh, kind of like put that like uh, layman's this definition in the chat for you a script is a small executable program um that we use to um, to to accomplish a certain task in it right? um and then so being that uh, that uh, code is a written is like a written language, um, as you guys know, with with all human languages, there are many different types. And the same thing comes into uh, into effect with scripting. So we have different kinds of scripting languages, and we have different kinds. Of Which is funny because <laughs> we have all these higher level languages. When I mean higher. I mean um, like further away from the machine language because machine language is ones and zeros is bits and bytes um you know a couple of weeks ago ones and zeros that's that's effectively how all the information that's in front of you um, and on the internet is communicated through bits and bytes but humans we we don't interact with information in that way we, we interact with the human language english through um spanish uh, Mandarin, Japanese, Hindi, you know, Umbu, all, all these, all these different languages, right? I, there's, I, there has to be over a thousand. Um, so it's kind of impossible for one human to know all these languages. Well, that's not the case with, uh, with computers, right? Like the, the, the underlying language is, is machine language, is zeros and ones, and then we humans built languages on top of that we use to communicate with them. Um, and then, so some of the, as the farther away you get from like the machine code itself, 
it's the closer you get to human languages. And and those those pretty much are our scripting. So a scripting language is really high up on the stack. And some of the and because of that, they're like some of the easier languages to learn. Um, they're more intuitive, they're more like everything. So um, so does anyone know what this little logo is for? It's one of the scripting languages that it, it's the second most popular. Is yeah. that JavaScript? Um, JavaScript? Yes, JavaScript. Or it might be the first. I think it might have been the, mo the most popular. So JavaScript, yes. And JavaScript is completely different from Java. Like if you guys know about some languages, you probably heard Java before. It's the one with the little like coffee um, mug on it. So JavaScript is different from that. It's not even derived from Java. The people who made JavaScript are not the people who made Java. Um, but this, so this is a really cool um, language. And you use it every day without knowing. So the entire like online web is built on HTML. And then JavaScript is, is what makes our HTML free. So if you are on ESPN.com and your favorite, like, uh, you, you know, your little highlights are clean, while you kind of read, read the stats or something like that, you know, the little ticker on the top, all that is done through JavaScript. So JavaScript, JavaScript is used to make all our web pages and web programs dynamic. They move, they interact well with your if you go into like a, a shopping uh, website and you move your mouse over the, the product and a little picture comes up out of it, that's done using JavaScript. So JavaScript uh, for that reason is very popular. It's a highly sought after tool for all IT professionals, not just web developers. Because you know, if you understand a little bit of it, you, you may be able to do troubleshooting or even help build your own um, web pages. So the next one here is kind of the one that um, dive into a little bit later. This one is an extremely versatile program in scripting language, and it's called Python. So um, Python is technically an interpreter language, meaning that it needs an interpreter to run. So like, um, if you're running Windows, um, usually the, the newer ones come with a Python interpreter already on them. But if, if you're not, you, you can easily download it. It's open source so, um, um, software, meaning that you know you don't have to pay for it. And um, and we use it for a lot of things. We use it <clears throat> to develop websites. We use it in math. We use it in machine learning. So Python is great for machine learning. It has a ton, a ton of libraries. It's extremely versatile. It's also one of like the second or third um, most sought after language. Um, for for developers, uh, so yeah, it's definitely. And the good thing about Python is that it's really like English, um, so it's really simple uh, to start like working. Then finally, we have our our shell um, environments down here. So who knows what the blue one? Is? Best Windows PowerShell. That is correct. So Windows PowerShell is the um, um, is the shell environment language for Windows operating system, and we'll we'll get more into that. But it's good that you were able to identify that. What about the black one? Best else? command prompt. Command prompt or Linux. Say it again. Linux. Yeah, so, so this is the shell in Linux, and um, there is a new one called Bash, which is born again shell. So you know either one of those, um, you would see this. Right, the born again shell might be a little pretty, it might have like a smiley face. I legit did not know that that's what it was. They meant. Yeah, and it had it has nothing to do with religion, but it's just like <laughs> it was like it was like the new iteration of yeah. A shell, I, and then that's where born again shell. Okay, I, yeah. I, I, hey man, I taught you something, Kelly. I know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy. Yeah, cool. <laughs> All right, so, so those are some of the uh, languages that we're gonna talk about a little bit today. Um, but again, uh, there are other other languages that can be used for scripting and 
program in general. I'm just going to throw out some of them. You don't, we're not going to talk about them, but it's just good to know. There's C, C Sharp, there's C++, there's C, there's Java, there is, there's Node, there's, there's Ruby on Rails, um, and there's just a lot, <laughs> so many of them. There's Kobo, Kobo, uh, Kobo is like, all goes all the way back to like the 60s and it's kind of like what uh, there's ada there there's a really large amount of options out there and what's great about them is that like all these engineers who design these these languages they all built them for with with their own strengths so they're think about like superheroes you know like um you know, you, you you have Aquaman and Batman, you're not gonna send Batman out into the middle of the Atlantic when you have Aquaman. So, you know, as, as we become more efficient in, in our tasks, more specialized, we'll have specific uh, like, tackles. But for our purposes, this is kind of like, these are like the Holy Grail. So we're gonna talk about, about these here, especially uh, Python, uh, PowerShell, Uh -huh. So the thing to remember with um, with when we're doing scripts is that we're gonna probably need some elevated access. So the shell is um, the Linux terminal, um, and basically it's our command line in Linux. All our shell scripts would be ended in the .sh extension, and this is important knowing being able to for the test right for the test is important to recognize the extensions and what language um they're talking about so um so when you're running a a, a shell script you need to you're going to need execute permissions on the file to run and you're probably going to need admin access on your profile as well so you probably need super super user access and then this little symbol here, we call it a shebang. It's the hashtag and the exclamation point. And this is used to denote um, that the file contains the shell script. So these are kind of like the, the takeaways that you need to be able to identify with the shell environment. Um, I am nowhere near proficient in shell, so um, I'm kind of leave, gonna leave you with the basics here, but I am a little bit better with the Windows scripts and we'll talk about so let's talk about the history first. So, um, so Windows has been along, around for a long time, and their their original command shell environment was the batch files, and those are written in a .dat uh, extension. And again, that was like the first generation shell script uh, where those batch files that evolved into Visual Basic scripts. Um, and this actually came with its own IDE. So uh, ID is called uh, added. So uh, uh, integrated development environment. Basically, what an ID is, is like a fancy, a fancy like text editor that also allows you to run code, debug, and things like that. That's what um, that's what an ID is. <laughs> and then the newer one that we have is PowerShell, and PowerShell is pretty awesome. So it's versatile, it's versatile, and then it has these things called command loops. And command loops are like specific commands that allow you to do things in PowerShell on, on your Windows. And there's also a PowerShell integrated scripted environment, which is the same thing as an IDE, except that it's for uh, specifically for PowerShell. So that's it's pretty comfy. It comes uh, pretty fun. So um, so you you could open up the ISE and like um, test your scripts. You can use it to help you edit the text, like uh, refactor thing. Um, so the term refactor means like, let's say, uh, let's say you're using a variable called name and you wanted it as lowercase, but then later later on, you're like, nah, you know, I want to switch it off to cat blocks, but you have, you're using that variable by 50 times in your script instead of having, instead of going in and changing that variable every single time. There's this thing called a uh, refractor when you click on the variable name or you right click on it, 
refactor it and then you name it. And then every, everywhere in your script where that variable uh, changes to what where that variable, variable was at, it'll change to your new value, which is pretty cool. Saves you a lot of time. We'll see some of that in a little. So, so again, these things in the parentheses are their extensions. So a PowerShell script will be ended in .ps1, and I will know that as PowerShell, a PowerShell file. Same thing for BBS, it'll end in .bbs, and batch file will be in .bbs. So we talked a little bit about <clears throat> we talked about uh so I, I said variable, but do you guys know what a variable is? A uh, possible outcome. Um a variable is just any object you assign and it can be assigned any value. Okay. Change. Kind of, kind of, kind of getting close to. Um, so, what's the variable there? Is it Darwin or is it Nathan? in the chat? Would it be name? So, name is the variable. So, name holds a value, right? So, that's why it's called a variable. So, think about like when you when you were in school and you were doing like algebra, right? And you had to find out what x was. You know, X was the variable, right? Because that's what was holding that mystery information, whatever its value is. Right? So it could change. You don't you don't know exactly what's it. It's kind of the same uh, in programming, except that um, we we tend to know what we're gonna put in our in our variables. So like 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 right now, I had a variable called name, and I'm gonna assign it a value of Rachel. Okay, and so, so, so three things that we're going to talk about is the the variable. So the variable is named, so that becomes a placeholder, right? Onto I assign something. So this equal sign is called the assignment operator, and basically what you're telling your program is take what's on the left and give it the value I'm going to input to the right. So and then you see that I put Rachel in little uh, single quotes. That's because uh, Rachel is a data type. It, it's to us, it's letters, right? But the computer doesn't know what it is. So you gotta, you kind of gotta tell it, hey, expect letters, expect string, which is what Rachel is. It's a string. I'm sorry, Rachel, you're not a string. Very <laughs> lovely instructor, but in, in this case, uh, the name Rachel is a string, which is a combination of letters, spaces, and characters. And um, and we given this variable, which is name the value of the name Rachel. So now, if I was to write a program, this, so let's say Rachel, so I've assigned, uh, I've assigned uh, the, the value of Rachel to name. And then I wanna say, I wanna do something like, hey, I want to say hi. My name is. And I'm not going to put that right. I'm just going to say, hey, I'm using a variable called name. I want to print out, hey, my name, my name is whatever is stored inside of name. And then, like, if I run this, I expect it to say, Hi, my name is Rachel. And then because we're not hooligans, we're gonna end our sentence with a curve. And let's go ahead and run this. So hi, my name is wait, why do I have a space? Hmm. But okay, so we got what, what we wanted, right? So we got a sentence that I told the the, the interpreter to run. And then I, at the end of the, somewhere in that sentence, I was like, hey, there's this variable called name. I want you to print whatever is stored inside of that name, right? Same, so like, um, 
let's assign picture a row. And someone had a question about double quotes, right? So let's see what happens when we use double quotes. And again, this is in, in Python. So the, the rules change depending on the programs that we use. Um, and let's print the second statement now. And then we can run that. Oh, I had a period already in sequence. All right, so now we have two variables, right? And we had one with, which was name, that had some value on it. And then we had a row that had another value. Both of these values um, are, are strings. And the way that we tell Python that it's a string is by either using single quotes Right or double quotes. Anything inside of these quotes, Python will inter interpret as string, meaning as character. Right, and those strings can have inside of them they can have spaces. Right, so you guys now see that Rachel is a teaching uh, assistant. Right, or they can have special characters. have numbers inside even though the numbers many of, can't many of those special characters will have different meanings outside the quotes so that'd be yeah yes the only time you could use them is inside the quotes yes and uh you could also put numbers in there so what what basically happens is when you tell the interpreter that you're using string it's like okay this doesn't concern me it's just print whatever is coming out because Usually, when we're not using string, then the uh, interpreter is going to be like, hey, I need to perform some kind of calculations on this. And, and it'll, take, it'll take that information and try to use, use the data types. So string is one type of data type. Then we have something called integers. Who can tell me what an integer is? All number. A whole number. OK, uh, give me an example of one. Zero, one, okay. one fifty six. <laughs> okay. Any 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 others? Negative two. Yes, thank you. So in any uh any number, negative or positive, whole number, right? So let's say that um So, all right, so now we have a new variable called num that holds the value negative 24. Now let's say that I want to do some quick math on num, right? So what's what's negative 24 times two, guys? Negative 48. 48 or negative 48? Negative 48. Positive. All right, so negative 48. Right, yeah. Now, if we were to change this to a negative, then positive, thing, right? Negative side of the negative, positive, right? So we can, so we can use, we can perform certain types of tasks and operations based on the data types that we provide. So, like, let's say I was fancy and I was like num times name. You guys think that that will run? Uh, no. Why, why is that, Julian? Is it because it's a name and a number? Okay, um, but let's see. So it's not it's it's not the variables, right? It's what is inside of it. So the data types. So Rachel is a string, and a number is an integer, and we can't perform arithmetic on a string, right? So let's try it out. All right, so so we get no value. That that should not not define. We can't do that. But let's say I change Rachel, and instead of name being um what is that so instead of name being an actual name i just whatever i'm putting in let's say 10. so now i can do that math right 
So I, I would expect something like 240 as a return. Right? So let's see. So hi, my name is 10. And we can, yeah, so negative 200. So the types of data that you um, um, So when you're assigning something in, in Python, specifically, when you're assigning a, a value to a variable, whatever you assign to it, it kind of like determines what you can do with it later. So there's another type of uh, numeric data type, and that is a double. Does anyone know what a double is? Um, uh, data type where des uh, decimal point following after. Yes. Uh, what did I do? That's the So let's do Hold on, let's do num times five times decimal. Do you guys think so? These are two different data types. Right. Um, num is an integer, which is we said already is a whole number, right? It could be negative or positive. Same thing for a, fl a float or a double, it, but it holds places after the decimal point now, right? It could still, like this could still be a vector. And that is a valid um, float, floating point or a valid. So in Python it's called floating, in other program language, in other languages it could be called a double. Or a double. But typically they, they refer to the same thing. <clears throat> so, you know, we would expect the outcome here to be uh, what is it, 30, 36, right? Uh, a negative times a, a negative is a positive, and then 1.5 times 24 should be 36. So let's see. Okay. But notice now we got a different kind of thing. So when you take a, when you take an integer and you multiply it via a double or a floating point, your result will always be a floating point, right? Because Python is going to take your integer and Represent it as a floating point, even though 36 is an integer, because you you perform an operation on it with a floating point, and it, it now gets assigned with um, data type. So that's kind of important if you're if you're trying to do things on specific kind of data. And then the last the last data point uh, data type that I want to. Um, Bring up to you guys is called Boolean. Does any know everyone know what a Boolean is? Those the guys that create problems at soccer games. <laughs> Not a hooligan, a Boolean. Yes, yeah, it's true or false. Yes, it's true or false. So uh, now I made a new data, uh, a, a new variable called here, and I'm going to assign it the value true. And so now I'm gonna do something fancy. So I'm typing in this little hashtag. Does anyone know what that is? What I just did here. You're commenting out. I'm commenting out. Um, what does that mean? It's, it just means that it's not gonna, it's not, the compiler is not gonna, read that that's right it's, it's gonna ignore it yeah perfect that's awesome that's good that's good so yeah so we use this thing called a comment um a comment symbol in python it happens to be the um the hashtag right or the number sign and we put that in front of whatever we want our program to ignore so right now i want my program to ignore all this stuff about printing right and then i'm going to make a new uh i'm going to do something new now where I'm gonna say if here is true, I want something to happen. So this is called a uh, a control statement. So uh, if uh, if else uh, control block is gonna evaluate a condition, and then it's gonna if it's if if that condition if that condition is is met, it's going to execute some code 
And if it's not, it's going to execute something else. So, um, so if here is true, let's print out. Um, name, comma, is here. Something is wrong with my grammar today, right? And then if I'm if if it's not, then I'm going to say else, and I'll print something else out. Um, and we're going to be go, I'm going to say go get whoever is supposed to be here. Right. So, so now we're doing this, we're, we're kind of like leveling up in our, in our, in our coding skills here, where we talked about a little bit about uh, variables, assigning and values and the different types of data types. Now we're, we're going to look at our first Con, uh, conditional statements, and which is the if else, and we're going to see. Uh, we're going to look at here, and we're going to see if it if it holds a value of true, and if it does, I want to print out this statement. If it doesn't, then I want to I want it to do something else, which is whatever is under the else uh, condition. Right. So uh, so what do you guys expect to print out? But what is our expected output? True. Cool. True. So we expect to we expect this statement to execute, right? So let's see if that happens. So I have a sorry. All right. So I made a mistake. All right, so I didn't assign it the value of here. I didn't assign the value of true to here because I used a double equals. So there's a difference between one equals and the double equal. So the one equal is the assignment, meaning that I'm giving the true value to here. And then what I'm what I'm doing down here <laughs> is I'm doing a, co a comparison, right? I'm saying if whatever is inside of here is exactly whatever is here, then that'll be true, right? So, um, so now I'm asking, hey, if here's value is exactly true, then go ahead and print um, DW is here. So let's see if it works now. Okay. So that goes to show that you need to um, be careful of what you know you're typing in. Remember what I told you earlier: garbage in, garbage out. In this case, I was ha uh, you know I was lucky that uh, Python is smart enough to be like, hey, you got to ever dummy go go fix it and I was able to see that. But let's say that I change this and now let's just write something like zero. All right. So here, so here now equals zero, right? But my statement stays the same. Um it, it shouldn't evaluate to true. So we would expect the second statement to to execute, which is the else statement. And let's see. Okay. So indeed that's what happened. The you know the variable no longer holds a true. Uh, is no longer assigned true. So this time, um, this statement executes the else the else part of it, and I have to go get the he's he's messing the lesson. All right. So that kind of like talks a little bit about those different components of uh, programming in general. At least the if and then. There's some more. Um, loops that I, I want to talk to you guys about and i have some examples for those for those but again um so let's talk about like our, uh like our arithmetic operators because a lot of times we'll we'll be we'll have to do things like um do some math right so what do you guys think this is here what what, would, what do we use this for multiplication so yeah so this here so in Python and in most other languages, the asterisk is um, multiplication. All right, what about this one? Division. 
what kind of division. We have have lots of divisions. Integer division, right? This one with, is what we call integer. Division. What about, does anyone know this one? Modular. Can you, can you explain to the class what modular means? I mean, modulo, my fault. Um, but, That's okay. Uh, it's 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 into it's interchangeable. The two terms, modulus or you're not, you're not you're not correct. For short, we just usually say mod. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It's like the it's like doing a division, but like it gives you the remainder. Yeah, it's perfect. So, so so let's see what let's see it right. So five divided by two. Let's print that. So an integer division, it basically just takes, it, it gives you the, the entire, um, uh, hold on. So no, this is just regular division. I'm sorry, whoever said that earlier, you were correct. And then I think this one would be, so this one is integer division. All right, all right. So let's actually, let's go ahead and copy and paste this. So we're gonna take five divided by two and then we're gonna do integer division on it and then we're gonna take five divided by two and we're gonna do modular division on it. And then we're gonna see the differences of them. Right? All right, perfect, this is perfect. So, so this is our, uh, so, so the single slash would be our regular division, right? If I, if I have a $5 bill and my kids are like, hey, um, and I got five dollars right, and I want to split it up between my kids. I would go get, I would make some change, and I would get them two fifty and two fifty, right? That would be the most equitable division of those five dollars, right? Equally, they they would both get the exact amount, and that's where that's where our you know regular division comes in. And if I could spell, how do you spell division, guys? D i v i s i o n. Thank you. D i. So like that, I got it right now. Hopefully. All right. And then, so that would be the most equitable. Right? But sometimes we don't want to deal with decimals because, like, let's face it, decimals suck. So, like, let's say I just want, you know, the the the, the closest whole number to 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 that division to to the as a quotient, right? Then we will use what we call integer division. And what it does is it takes it takes the last whole number that was able to divide the original. Uh, number and it'll repeat that. So the last whole number that can divide five is two, right? So we got back two for integer division. And then in modular division, we don't care about anything else. We just care about what's left over, right? So uh, when you divide five by two using mod mod division, you get you get the leftover of one. So you get the remainder. If I was to change this, right? So instead of five, let's do eight. What do we expect our answers to be? What do we expect the answer for the first one to be? Four. Four. Second one? Four. Four. And the last one? Zero. Zero. That would be my expected outcome too. And let's just double check that. All right. So yeah, so in the first one, we got um we got back four, right? But notice, notice the what kind of data type is this that it returns back? It's your floating point. A floating point. So when you do regular division, you get back a floating point answer. When you do integer division, it's kind of in the name, right? So you get an integer back. And then the same thing when you do a, a, mod, a, a mod division, you'll get back an integer. So I right? have a quick question. Sorry. Yes, sure. 
like you mentioned earlier, like for any operation, we assign variable a value, right? But yeah. here in this operation, you didn't assign like. Oh one. yeah. So um, how this happened? I mean, like, I'm just curious. So you, so we use so variables. We use them to store our information, right? Especially when we want to, um, when we want to reuse that code for later. So, so that's that's where we. So think about a variable as a container that holds something in it, right? So the name, so name is a container, right? And it holds DW. The, it holds these letters in it. And then num up here is another container and it holds this value. And the way, the reason we use that is to actually make our job easier in case we're doing, um, you know, in, in case we're writing a program or we're going to reuse this code. That's why we, we, we use that book. Sometimes we have simple problems and we just, we just want to find out um, outputs or something like that. And that's kind of what I'm doing now. Like, I, like I just want to do some, some basic math right now because I'm, I, I just wanted to show the differences of the division um, operators. So I don't have to, I, I can just do the math, right? Um, I, I, I can just tell the computer, hey, I'm gonna give you some, I'm gonna give you some input. It's gonna be in in numbers, right? So remember that it's not in quotes. So the computer is seeing this exactly for what it is, it's numbers. And then these special characters mean something to the computer. So remember like if I, if I put, if I put the, that symbol in this in in this statement here, it's not it's not going to change anything for the computer because it's inside of the quotes, meaning that it's a string. But because there's no strings in the bottom, this this means so something totally different to the computer. It means hey, take eight, divide it by two, and give me the remainder. So in, in short, is we use variables are very important. We do use it when we're writing longer uh, longer scripts and we want to reuse our code. But we at the same time we don't. We don't only have to use variables. We can we can perform tasks without without variables. Sometimes. I don't if that does that answer your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. So, um, again, this and my, by the way, this is much longer than than the uh, the one I do for my class because my classes we usually only have you know an hour and a half, maybe two to go over these things. But that's kind of like what operators are. I didn't talk over all of them. There are some other operators like um, um Aren't you gonna do like a mini Python course for them? What? What? <laughs> aren't, you like, aren't you gonna do like a mini Python course for Megan? Yeah, Megan? Like uh <laughs> I think Giovanni's gonna do the little mini Python or together. <laughs> um Giovanni's really good. You know, he works in he works for Verizon as a Python as a developer. Oh, that's cool. I did not know that about you, man. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so he's actually, he's actually the GOAT. Um, but yeah, I can, I, I can do things like that. So the last thing that that's on here that I didn't get to talk about are the for and the while loops, but I have, I have examples of those that I already set up for you guys. Um, okay. Um, and then, so a constant is a variable that you don't want to change. And you usually would that declare that in your, in your in your in your script or in your program as a with with either a, a keyword um, in Java it's like final other some some languages have have different keywords to to make um, um, variables constants and that just means that you never want the value of that record to change um, and then so the other things we'll talk about so now we're going to go into Python sorry not Python PowerShell. Uh, and we're going to run this as administrator. So the thing to remember is when you're doing stuff, <clears throat> when you're doing stuff in in PowerShell, you're usually going to be running scripts and stuff like that. And depending on how you have your permissions set up, you're going to probably need administrator access. So I'm going to right click on PowerShell, run as administrator. And then I'm going to open it up, and you guys should be able to see my. You guys see my PowerShell line, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So we'll talk about Python JavaScript in a second. All right. So I'm making this bigger. I know it's a little hard to see, um, but just bear with me for a little bit. All right. 
so I do have some PowerShell scripts on here, and they're somewhere in my in my system. Does anyone know the? Can anyone tell me how to how to get to the root of this? Um, of my uh, yes, my PowerShell. What's the root? CD space dot dot. CD space dot dot. I'm gonna trust you. Okay. So I went back. I, I I went back one. How what would have been the correct command to go from my two? So the curvy thing. Yeah. The what? A curvy, curvy. The well, curly one on the top left. Right. Okay. This. Yeah. Tilda. Oh, yes. the tilde. Oh, she said it already. <laughs> you right, got so it too. So, so the what is what do we call that? Tilde, so, the tilde key. Tilda. All right, so that took me to a different group system. On a Mac, I just press CD. But I don't think that works on Windows. Yeah. Would you add an extra dot? Make so it three dots. Oh, that's that's that that's not it. That's error. that's my fault though because it was error. supposed to be. Still, that's error. still error. All right, it's 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 simple, guys. So it's the backslash or the forward. What do we call this? The forward slash or the backslash? Kelly, what is that? That uh, is the backslash. The backslash. Forward. Thank you. All right. So CD backslash will take you all the way to the root. Okay. Um, I do actually wanted it. I did want to be a user of Dar Darwin though. So that's pretty funny. <laughs> that is where I want to go. So I want to go to users. Uh, What am I doing now? What is this called? You didn't hit put CD to change directory. Yeah, but what? But what is this called? What did I just write out? Absolute path or something like that. Yeah, so I wrote I wrote out I wrote, I wrote off the top, right? All right. So now um so now I'm in the directory that I want to be, um, but I forget what I got it here. So how can I list the things that I have? D A R. What's another way that I could do it? Tell us. All right, cool. All right. So we're here now. I kind of told you guys the extension for PowerShell. So how many PowerShell scripts do I have in this directory? Four? One, two, three, four. That is correct. I do have four. Can you please tell the class how you got those? I looked at the end of the extension .ps1. So, and .ps1 is the extension for PowerShell? Correct, right? Yes. Yes, good job. All right, awesome. Sorry, I asked a lot of questions. Um, so. I, I like interacting, so um, I appreciate all you guys um, tagging along with it. So that's good. All right, so let's. Um, so is is this uh, case sensitive? Yes, it is. It is case sensitive. It's also space sensitive, white, like white spaces matter. And you also need to um, kind of like understand which command you're trying to. All right, so I have a I have a file here that opens up a web page. Which one do you guys think of it based on based on the titles? That's kind of like an unfair question, right? Because any of these could have anything inside. We have no way of knowing, right? Um, but it's test op. So let's do. Um, And I could be totally wrong, and this cannot be the command, but I think it is. So 
So, so what these things are are scripts inside. So there's there's code inside of these files, and uh, and basically what what the um, what PowerShell is going to do is going to go to these files, open up the open up those files, and anything that it realizes is code, it's going to take it and it's going to execute it for me. And so I messed this up, right? I think that's what you're telling me that. that T. Okay, that's a lie. <laughs> All right, so test out that. Nope, that's not what I want. What do I want at the end here? PS. Yeah, thank you. Yes, awesome. All right, so um, so either this is gonna work and my and my website's gonna open, or or it's not gonna work and it's gonna be some it's gonna give me an error message. All right, so it worked, and we're at test out. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys are familiar with test out at this point, right? Like you guys taking mocks and all these things. I, I know that you guys were taking mocks last week. So, as you guys know, I, I love test out. It has a ton of useful tools there, and it is our hands-on practice. So, I figured this would be a good web page to open up with our script. All right, so I got it to. So I, ha I have. You know, I told PowerShell to open up a file. It got some instructions from that file, and then it opened up. Right. So now I want to go into. So this is all that my script read, these little things. So if I take this, copy it, and I run this directly onto PowerShell, what do you, what do you guys think is going to happen? It's going to go to the website? It's the same thing. Right? It's going to go and it's going to open up and process that. Because that, that's actually the instructions that I have, right? So. A script, like we said earlier, is a file that contains a certain amount of instructions for a computer or system to, to execute, right? And the, the good thing about the scripts is that by, by, um, by telling our, by making those files um, in, into their appropriate extensions, this automatically tells the operating system, hey, yeah, you can go and execute, it's an execute. So remember when I was talking about commandlets earlier, and we didn't see some of them. So this is a commandlet um, to run a an executable, and then you just got to type out the um, the I'm in I'm in the command line right now. I mean in, I'm in the directory that I, that I want to do. So this will go and open that whatever file I'm in at that directory. So I want to open up. Um, check ping. So check ping is another script script file that I wrote. Not that I wrote, but that I'm that I'm gonna open up for you guys. This is this is actually a pretty useful one that I found online on GitHub. And um, basically it's gonna it's gonna take some instructions that I wrote and it's gonna give us some output. All right. And I, I know what it's doing, but um, but you you probably won't, right? Because it's it's in the background. You don't you don't you haven't seen the you haven't seen the script yet, so you don't know exactly what's going on. All right, so so you guys saw a little status bar at the top that was saying, "Hey, checking checking the ping to to nine websites or something like that." And use that that's what the status bar said. And then finally, I got some output after the program running, which is um, completed. Ping latency is whatever this means: four milliseconds to twenty-one milliseconds. Is the average. average, right? So if I go into back into my scripting file and I open that up. That thing. So this one's a lot more, a lot, a lot more things going on than the simple test out. So we have um, some more instructions. We have a thing called a for loop in here. We have a thing called an array, um, and then we have this fancy block here telling telling us like what this does. 
and what it doesn't, you know, what it does, all these other things. So these are comments, but these are multi-line comments. And in PowerShell, we do multi-line comments like this, the less, the less than sign followed by the hashtag and then write whatever you want the comments to be. It could be for as long as you want, as long as you end it. You know, after you're done commenting, you do the hashtag and then and then everything inside here is ignored by PowerShell, right? This is just, you know, this is useful to me, right? So basically the person who wrote this uh, script gave us some pretty cool things. Like they gave us a synopsis, a description. Um, so uh, an example, and then the link to their, to their, their authorship. But again, these are all, comments and actually these are a little bit more sophisticated than just comments. These are called like documentation. So like the higher, you know, as you progress in your career, like you'll you start doing things like this, right? So like the the fact that he uh, that he denoted this in like dot synopsis, this this will allow me to go into like my, my ISC. And if I have this file, I will be able to um, type in uh, the file extension, the file name, and then dot synopsis, and I would get whatever output he has. These are kind of like definitions, right? right? But again, these don't execute actual, these are just, just you know, the information that he wrote. So what the, so basically what, what's going on here is, is, is actually pretty cool. So the, 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 the person wanted a way to test connectivity to some popular websites, right? Um, so kind of like just checking, uh, you know, the ping, and then kind of like checking how how quick um, hosts are responding to these websites. So uh, th this person made a um, an array, right? An array of strings, right? Because remember, everything inside of double quotations is a string. So he made this array of strings um, and he called it hosts. And uh, array is a, think about another another container, but it, it could just hold multiple things. So he made some, He made this big container and he has all these um, things in it. So he has amazon.com. Um, they're all separated by a comma, right? So these are his parameters. Then he goes in and he, and he does this thing called a try. So a try is like, um, it's exactly what it is, right? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's try to do something, right? Try to do everything inside of this block. So these curly braces, we, we call them blocks because they contain blocks of code in them. So this person was like, try to, um, try to do the following, the following command, the following instruction. So the first thing is write progress. So he's writing at the top of our screen this fancy little cute little message sending a ping to my pocket post. Then it's gonna take uh, this host array, right? So he's making a new array down here. And what, what he's saying is, hey, make this new host array by taking whatever is inside of hosts, right, host, and splitting it wherever you see a comma inside the string. So he's gonna go into these, into this big array up here. And he's gonna take uh, he's gonna take everything that is to the left of a of a comma, and he's gonna add it to a new array called host array down here. So so basically, he's gonna get nine of them, right? So um, and then ping. So ping is another variable, and what this does is test that connection from whatever the computer name is to the host array. And it'll go count minus one. So it'll go to it'll, it'll go to the last one, right? And then after it pings that one, it'll it'll drop that one off. It'll Twitter, it'll drop that one off. Go to live, go to Google, all the way till it ends up back at the first one. And then what uh, what he's doing is for each of the pings, he wanted it to see latency. So he's gonna he's gonna print the lowest. So in when we talk about latency, the lowest number will be the fastest. And then he's gonna, so that would be min. And then he's gonna print the max. So he's gonna print the, the, the one that took the longest. And then he's gonna take an average 
And he's basically just saying, hey, for average, take all the pings and then divide it by the by the total count. And then finally he's gonna write, um, he's gonna write at the bottom what we saw, which was the min. So the ping latency is min, the max, and then the average. So um this is kind of hard to see on, on, on a notepad. But if I was to take this and open it in something like ESC. So VSC is a another um, I, IED or integrated development tool. Um, tool. All right, and it kind of like makes it a little easier to see. All right, so everything that is like light blue is, what do you guys think is everything that's like light blue? Out of the things that we talked about. Your variables. Variables, yeah. So they're all, so, and we said variables are like containers that hold certain values in them, right? So the first one is an array up here, like I said already, that holds strings. Then we have, um, we have another array where we're taking each one of these individually and splitting it. And then we have the ping variable, which actually holds um, the code to test the connection to, to whatever array we're trying to get. And then after that, we have the, the variable for min, the variable for max, and then we have an average variable. So yeah, so that's what I, I, I want to see if you guys um, understood that those were, were variables. So again, this is a, a much more sophisticated program than the simple one that we ran with um, with test out, but who could tell me why this would be important, like, and why we could use this, or quote something like this. Why use ping, or why use- no, Why use ID? like a, uh, no, why use a script like this? To check if you can connect to other websites. Yeah, so that that is good, right? But I can I can do that easily, right? I can um, I can just go, um, I I can just go in and try to connect to testout.com, right? Why why do I need something as something he's so comparing, much? He's comparing of different websites, right? Yes, okay. right. Uh, so check the multiple multiple websites at once. But think about it in a in a in a environment, in a professional environment, are you usually going to be handling just one device at a time? Let's say that you're responsible for the marketing department and everyone in marketing is telling you, hey, we can't connect. So then you have to go and check every single one of those. Let's say they have a hundred PCs and you have to type something out like this a hundred times, as opposed to having a script that you could you could push out over a remote connection and then execute those 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 that script for every one of those connections, which one would save you more time? Which one is more efficient? The script on which like one program and we can check the whole hundred pieces. Yeah, right. So the, the, that's where the that, that's where the power comes in, right? The power is that you're able to take something, um, save it, and then use it in in a in a in a greater scope. It might be that it's only five computers. It might be that it's only one, right? But you need us. So you have this this program that already works is hopefully you tested it and, and you debugged it and everything. And anytime that you have a connection issue or that you're trying to figure out where these connection problems are starting from, or you want to see anything like that, you can go ahead and take your script and run it. You could run it across multiple devices, multiple clients, and you have expected outcomes, right? Like you should know, hey, on a good day, my average should be something around seven to 10 milliseconds. If it's anything over 15, we have a serious issue and then we got further investigation, right? So that's kind of like um, um, that's kind of like one of the the uses for these kind of things. Um, I have a lot of stuff on my screen right now. Can anyone tell me how I can clear it off? Can you just type clear? Yeah. So, all right. So so yeah. Um, kind of like I just want you I want you guys to remember that a script again holds specific instructions that that we can 
execute directly through our OS. Uh, the Windows uh, Windows allows this to happen via PowerShell. Um, on Linux, we would be able to do it um, over the shell, right? And then um, they can be very simple. Um, there could be some very complicated ones, but ultimately, what they do is they, you know, they make our tasks. Uh, you know, we we could spend five hours writing a script, so that way we don't spend sixty hours every month doing the task that that script does. You know what I mean? So you, it does take a lot of effort usually to to write really good scripts, right? But it saves us time in the long run. So we put up we put the time in at, at the in the in the beginning to gain the benefits at the end. And then the good thing about this is, hey, um, you know, Kelly gets hired tomorrow as a network technician somewhere, and he's like, hey, BW, um, I need a script for pinging hosts. I know you have a really good one, or do you know where I could get one online? Can you send me it? And then, you know, through this through this process. Right, he's able to to save that time, and so it allows even people who um, who haven't dealt with the scripting um, building themselves to actually execute. Because you know, I could be like, "Hey, Kelly, this is a this is a, this is a pinging script," and it'll tell you, you know, it'll give you an average an average ping for nine different websites. You can use this to test your connection. He's like, "Oh, great!" Right, and then he knows if he's getting some some really bad lag times that he needs to go and do some further research on. On his network and see what's going on. Um, okay, um, so we're still in the scripting file. I need to. I, I want to go back and look at some other things. So how do I how do I list those contents again? DIR. DIR. Awesome. All right. Um, check ping. Test that. Um, um, how do I list what's inside of a file? Do you guys remember that? No, inside of a file. I want to open a file on my okay. computer. Okay. And I want to open useful. Isn't there wasn't there a can't you just press tab to finish it? Thank you. I was trying to tap. Uh, thank you. Yeah, there you go. I was trying to remember it. I'm like uh, I'm typing um I'm typing typing shift, I'm typing right arrow because all right. So yeah, so cat will open up um We'll open that file up and show me what's inside. So I have this thing here. Um, so this is a PS1, right? So it's a PowerShell script, and then I have a couple of different things. Uh, so I want to run this one. I could have executed this, right? But I know I know that I know that it has two different scripts, and I I wanted to talk about them. Oh, okay, so whatever, so I'm not going to do it. All right, so the first script has um, some information about my BIOS. So you guys remember your BIOS, it's kind of like, it's, it's firmware, meaning it's a combination of both hardware and software. And um, it's kind of like if you if you destroy your BIOS, you destroy your motherboard, you kind of what motherboard would be really expensive. So we're always careful when we're updating our BIOS. But um, furthermore than that, it's kind of, of a bad day. It's the beginning of a bad week, probably. <laughs> Screw a day, dude. You mess up your BIOS, you you messed up your whole week. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. So, um, but BIOS tends to be like manufacturer specific. Sometimes we don't know, like I had no idea before I did this um, uh, lesson that the actual manufacturer of my BIOS is called American Megatrans. Like, why would I know that, right? But like in, in case you're working in an environment where you have like 15 different manufacturers, like you might have some Dell computers, you might have some HP computers, you might have some Apple computers, you might have some, some Google, Google Chromes, I don't know. Things like this, right? Uh, 
uh, well, we're talking about power cells. So you might have some surfaces or, or, or things like that. You, you want to check what bios you're, you're working on because uh, you want to flash your bios for whatever reason. You want to make sure that you know that you know what you're doing. So you want some information. This is a script that you could use for that. And it basically tells you some, you know, you know, the the actual facts about your bios, like your serial number, its name, and the current version that you're All right. And then the second script just gives me um, some more information about my system. Like it's telling me um, my manufacturer is telling me the model of my system, the name of it, uh, who owns it, and then finally my my total my total physical number available. Um, so yeah, so these are like, and you know, these are easily um, found online. Like you can just go in and type into Google like simple, um, simple like useful scripts, right? And then you can go ahead and see what they do, see if it's something you want to try out, copy it. Um, so yeah, um, again, uh, the the PowerShell uh, Power, PowerShell extension is .ps1, and this allows us to actually run it directly on the objects. That's kind of kind of what I want to wanted to cover. PowerShell. Is there anything that you guys are a little unclear that I made worse, or do you guys want to move on? Yeah. Question. Um, the useful script tutorial .ps1. Was that something you downloaded online? Is that what you meant where you could? So I found this one was actually the first one that I ever, these are the first ones that I ever did when I was in this class. Um, and so I found, I found a website that has like a hundred of them. And I, and I picked them, you know, I picked some simple ones to talk about and you know, I just copied them. Over. Um, I didn't have to change anything specifically. They were already there. And if you type that out, useful script tutorial, I think that'll probably take you. So I wouldn't have to like download the script and then run no, it. No, so I don't, I don't, I don't suggest that you. Uh, so when you download things directly, make sure that you trust where you're downloading from. So in my case, I didn't download it; I just copied and pasted it, and I typed it. In. I did it. I did what I what you guys saw. In my so, like I copy and pasted it into Notepad. Also, I wanted to, like, before you do that, you want to, like, read what it's doing, read what the expected outcome is, see if it's something that you're comfortable with running, and then, and then run. So, like, if you take this, like, I'll, I'll, I'll type this in the chat for you. I'll put it in chat, and you could run it on your, you could run that in your PowerShell. It should, it should work. Oh, so I can write my own in Notepad, for example, and then just run it in PowerShell, and it would execute the command? Yeah, exactly. Or the instructions? Okay, yes. Okay. So again, um, so uh, the the scripts themselves are are files that are already ready to execute, right? But what they hold inside of them are commands. And if you don't want to go through the script, you could just you could just type those commands into into your PowerShell and they'll. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right. Um, So like, let's say I change this to, like, like this is something that I just copy and paste it, but I change, I change this, you know, to go to somewhere else and then, I didn't get my expected outcome here. Is it because I messed up and it's not supposed to be that IT? Oh, it's Kahoot. So I don't know if Kelly ever told you about me, but um, I was like, I was very into Kahoot. You know, Lauren. No. Yes. Unfortunately, right. with this group, we can't use it. It's too large. How many? How many you have here? Uh, Forty. They max us out at 20. Uh, at what? <clears throat> 20. Oh, the spelling, you need the H. Yeah. I also need 
Uh, I must have, I must have something up here. But I have used your your pull method. I think it's because the you're using a double bracket on the end and a single bracket on the beginning. No, it's I'm I'm missing that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So that's a. Uh, let's go back to the PowerShell script. All right. So yeah. So this argument. So uh, so the argument list is you're basically saying, hey, uh, all right. So I didn't actually walk you guys through what this is doing, right? So um, I'm telling PowerShell or telling telling the the operating system, hey, go and start a process, and I want you to start this process at this argument, all right? These are the arguments. So the argument would be uh, file path, and then I gave it a file path, right? And file path is the path for the Chrome executable file. Right. So I was like, go find this executable file. Here's the address. All right. Once you find that, I gave it some more arguments. All right. And then these are always the case in single quotes. But since I'm starting a full screen for a website, then I have to enclose that website. My eyesight is pretty bad. Let's see that. And then once you run that, if I run it again. Yeah, so um, so yeah, Kahoot messes it out. It's fun. Too much. But those were fun, man. Yeah, pretty competitive. Yes. All right. So we so, use the poll the poll method that you created. <laughs> oh, the poll method, yeah. With the multi-select, multi-choice. <laughs> All right. Um there's a new thing called Slido. Giovanni uses that a lot. Slido. All right, so uh, finally, so so JavaScript, like I told you guys earlier, um, uses the extension .js. We, I kind of talked about this already. It's used heavily in, in web applications, the most popular script in my opinion, there is. Um, and then um, so there's, a, there's one specifically for Mac OS called uh, JavaScript for, auto, for automation, and that is JS8. So it uses the same kind of extension. And then Python, and then Python uh, .py um, is extremely versatile, um, and but it does need to be interpreted, like I told you earlier. So you do need to, if you're going to run it on your system, you do need a Python interpreter. Usually, Windows comes with one already. And if it doesn't, if you don't have one, you can download one off, um, off of Python themselves. Usually, if you go into like search bar and you don't have it because it's so highly used and it's um and it's, it's such in high demand when those will be like hey do you want that and you go and download and that there's that some you, free they, there's several free options some are you know more user friendly than others so you just gotta kind of find the one that fits for you. Yeah yeah um well so there are several IDEs but Python itself the underlying interpreter goes back to Python. So IDEs are like the, the, the fancy little, um, so like, uh, so this is the the virtual, the virtual, the VS Studio ones, right? This is Microsoft, uh, Microsoft one. And kind of like, I could write on this, I could write Python, I could write HTML, I could write Java, I could write C-sharp. Like they made this a really awesome platform where you could go and write all your different languages and you could like custom it, cu customize it for all those different things. But then I have a different one called PyTron. I think I put you on this one, Kelly. I don't know if you use it. And yeah, I think it's the one you like. You uh, and, yeah, and this is the do. one I used to learn Python because it was really like, user friendly. Like Kelly's saying, it, like it corrects things for me, and it was really, really intuitive thing to use. Um, that's gonna take a while to load because it's been a while. Uh, so yeah, so like you guys see, I have a lot of files because. Um, yeah, I've been practicing Python for a little bit over a year now, so I have a lot of different things on here, a lot of errors. So these are like these are like some of my first homeworks that are here. But yeah, so um, again, it's a thing of how comfortable you are with one. So if like um, the one thing that if, if you're new to this, right, and you're like thinking about doing something like learning Python, like that don't. It's easy to get frustrated, especially once you start getting errors. And, and stuff, but then once you get the once you start getting the hang of it and things start to run, you know, like there's like there's kind of like no feeling like it. 
it's almost um it's kind of like a high almost like when you like you spend a week working on a program and, and it runs and it does everything that you need it to do it's it's a pretty it's a pretty cool feeling so definitely um expect some frustration but don't be deterred how uh how are you doing with python um i had to take a little bit of a break just because of everything going on but I am uh, actually getting back into it very soon. I've been doing like a lot of study sessions around uh, cybersecurity analysis right now, just trying to re-up that and then right. back on to Python. So you, are you going to do the um, the Coursera cybersecurity? Or you're like, nah, that's not me. I think, honestly, it, I mean, I may look at it and see if it can offer anything new, but I'm honestly going to be diving into the test out cybersecurity ones because it looks like they gave you some hands on stuff in labs and that'll look pretty cool. All right, cool. Because right. through CUNY, um, I'll have to show you this, but like the list of stuff that we have access to in test out is awesome. Wait, we still have access to CUNY? Uh, no, I'm doing the. Uh, oh, you're doing the, the night shift one. Yeah, how's yeah. that work? It's it's rough without TAs. Oh, uh, okay. All right, we'll, 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 we'll catch up on, about that. Yeah, no worries. You, what time do you guys do you get on the break? Um, well, we're going to be doing lunch here in a little bit, but uh, it's Fridays. Typically, Fridays, we try to cut out early, so we skip lunch a little bit, and we just got, like, three labs to go over after we're done here. All right, we got, like, three slides. Yeah, go ahead and crush it out. Um, so... All right, so this, remember when Kelly's telling you that the extensions are important? This is, so for the CompTIA exam, this is kind of like their, uh, this is like their holy grail. They want you to know these extensions. They want you to know how you, um, how you comment in them. And, and then basically they want you to know what a variable is, what a, what a loop is, what a, a if, else. Those are what, that's what they want you to know. They want you to know crazy. But yeah, so I would screenshot this so you know all your extensions and how to comment on them. And then, um, so use cases for scripting is like, we, we want them to interact with our operating systems. So kind of like how I ran those, those scripts straight from PowerShell and those to be able to interface with them. That's kind of what we want scripts to do. We, and then our, Cases um, for like base, like this is on the basic level. We can use scripts to restart machines, remap our network drives, push out installation of apps, start updates, do our backups. Like you can have a script that does all your backups for you, and all you got to do is run the script at the end of the day, then at the end of the week, at the end of the month, and so on. Right? And then again, after they're done, you would go back and just test them, right? But you, know, you don't have to go out and type out those commands every single time you have a script. That you execute, and then um, uh, another basic uh, tool would be for gathering data. So um, you know, in our field, data is king, and sometimes we want to like look at our logs, look for specific things that are in logs, and we can write scripts, right? That that do that. So, right, those are um, those are some of the use cases for it. And then um, again, like everything, like any sword. Right, um, it can be used for protection, and it could be used for, you know, malfish malfish reasons. And uh, along with that, um, you know, you could use a hammer to hammer a nail. But if you're not paying attention when you're hammering something, you could probably break your hand at the same time. Right. So we want to be careful when we use the scripts. We want to be aware of things like malware risks because sometimes, like if we're using core uh, and uh, code that we got online or something like that. There might be some modifications on there that we're not um, we're not exposed to. And because of this, we like increase our surface with attack. So for the for the most cases, uh, our, our our systems will have things like uh, settings where we can't run scripts, right? And we might need either admin access or we might have to do things in our firewall to allow us to run them. And you know, because we're humans and we tend to like forget about things, we might forget to go back and change those firewall configurations. We might disable things and forget to back them, you know, put them back to the way they were. And, you know, those things could um, create potential security risks as well. And then the last thing is um, 
a browser or system crash due to mishandling of resources. And this is uh, specifically for like if you're making too many logs, you can crash your system because you're like, just making a ton of data and you're slowing. So you slow down your RAM, you might slow down your, your drive performance. And then if you have um, careless loops, um, careless loops and tend to um, lead to infinite loops or endless loops. And basically when this happens, a program just keeps executing forever. And those for 99.9% .9 of the time, we don't want that to happen. There are some very like, niche cases where you do one and endless loop, but for the most part, you don't want this happening. What happens is all the resources that are needed to run that program are always going to be all those, all those resources will be locked up indefinitely. So you'd set an instance like attempt nine times, and then if not successful, do something else. Yeah. So, and then, and then the last thing is a faulty use of API. And that means that you're, uh, if you're using um, an API um, and it's either not integrating properly, issues with the API itself this could cause the system to crash. And stuff. Um, so the last things that I wanted to talk about are, uh, we're talking about Python again. So um, are we still in the script room? Um, we are. So Python is extremely versatile. It's, um, you can use it across both Windows and um, and Linux and it's, and for that reason, we can also use it for online applications, data science, cybersecurity, IT automation, machine learning, um, game development. Like, like it's just immensely, immensely versatile. And um, and uh, IT IT professionals use it a lot. But um, so, like I said, it interfaces well with both PowerShell and and uh, and Linux, and we we can see examples of that. Um, right here from my PowerShell command, like I want to execute this Cyber Ninja um, file. So I'm going to give um, PowerShell the command is pi, which will let it know that I want to open up, um, I want to run a, a, power, a, power, uh, a Python file, and then I'm going to type in the name of the file. So if I can spell today, that Then I'm going to run that. All right. So the same thing that happened earlier with the with the PS1 uh, files, with the PowerShell files, I told I told I told Windows, hey, um, this next this next file that we're going to open is going to be a, a Python executable file, and this is the name of it. I want you to go ahead and run that program. So so PowerShell is like, yeah, sure, I can do that. I got you the I went ahead, it ran my code, and this is the output that it gave me. So whatever program I have, this is what I wanted to get out of, right? And so if we open this up, uh, so I'm gonna open it up here, but it's gonna be a lot of output, but it should be okay. So this is everything that's written inside of it. So this is, uh, Actually, can't copy. Okay, so this is in in in, in VS Studio. So this is what's inside of there. So how how many how many variables do I have here, guys? You got six. I got six. What's the data type of name? And guys, please feel free to uh, type in the chat. I want as many of you to participate as possible. Yeah, so go ahead. I, I heard you starting to say it, right? You, yeah, it's a string. String, all right. Someone else, what's the data type for Go? What kind of data is stored in Go, guys? Uh, 
Is it also not a data string? It's a string. Yeah. A string. Yes, correct. All right. Message. So message has some funky things going on. Remember when I told you we can't we can't do math with strings? Yeah, I remember that, right? When we tried to do earlier, like num times name, we didn't get we didn't, we didn't get an output, right? Do that. So I'm kind of if you see this plus sign, you would think that I'm adding main and go to to whatever this string is and whatever. And I kind of am doing that, but this is in a this is a concatenation and concatenate. Uh, concatenate. There you go. Concatenate is a it is a tough one to say. Concat. No, con concat. Uh, concatenate. Concatenate. There you go. Concatenate. Um, I've been trying for two years. So basically, what this means is that we're taking a string, and we're adding other strings to it right so but the end result is still going to be a string so therefore message in this case is all you know of the data type string so we're taking whatever so we're taking hey my name is and then we're adding uh my the value of name um my my and my goal is to become a whatever my goal is that we're adding what about uh, email? What kind of what kind of data type is email? Valuable. What's variable. the value? So email is the variable. But what kind of data type? What kind of data is this inside? String. 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 What about row? String. String. Yeah. So these are all strings. Yes. Good job, guys. You, you guys are like, this is a trick question. It can't be the right ones. That, no, but it is. Why? Because everything's inside of quotation, right? I told you guys, Python sees anything inside of quotation as a string. So good job, everyone who answered. So now let's give me a new variable, age. Uh, and I am 34 years old, I think. And then I'm going to type in real age. How do you say, how do you spell real? R-E-A H equals uh, So what is the data type of age now, guys? The top one here? 34. Integer. Integer, yes. And then what would be the data type of? Float. Float. Yes. Awesome. Great. All right. So we have some of our things here. And then let's make a new, a new variable. It's going to be lesson, and we're going to assign it the value. Actually, and we're going to say, hey, uh, lit is assigned. What kind of what kind of value is this? What kind of data type of that? Boolean. And Boolean can only be one of two things, right? It could be either true or it could be false. OK, so we kind of, so you guys had a good memory of what we talked about earlier as far as types. So, so then the last thing that I didn't talk about was the for loops. Um, so, so profile list and profile are, are actually um, a little bit more complex of data types. So a list is another data type and basically it holds a list of elements. In my case, it happens to be these these variables up here. So I put all these variables in a in a list, and then 
So if I was to type, if I was to print out print So if, um, a pro tip, if you're like ever coding yourself and you want to quickly comment some stuff out, just highlight whatever you're trying to comment and then control forward slash and you will be able to comment that block out. That's kind of like what I did, control forward slash and you can uncomment the same way and then comment. And that way, and this is universal across um, most languages. So if you do this, it'll, it'll, you don't have to worry about because you know sometimes you'll forget, depending on the language that you're writing. So that's kind of like a nice quick um, pro tip there. Okay, so I want to I want to I want to print my profile list. So what do you guys think is going to print? Name, email, role, goal, message. Okay, so is it the is it the the variables or is it the values inside of that? The values. Yeah, I think that's that's what we that's what would be most useful for this program, right? We want mm -hmm. to see what's stored inside of each one. So let's see if that runs. And indeed, that's what happened, right? So we had. So this is our uh, this is our list, and the way that you know that it's a list is Python's going to put put it all inside of um, square brackets, letting you know, hey, this is a list, and then every element is going to be. Uh, separated by by commas and we know that is a string because it's, it's inside of the image. So the first one is a string Darwin Gomez, the second one is a string my email, the second one is my code. And you know, that's kind of what a what a list is. Um, we could do the same thing with a num list. Like let's say let's call this a num list. And let's uh, all right so someone give me a number. Just come on. Five. Five. Another number, please, guys. 27. 27. Another one. 17. Hello. What? 17. 17. I heard 11. Yo, 11. 23 because of Jordan. 99 because of Judge. 55 because of Matsui. All right. So we have a nice little list over here. Uh, of numbers. Let's see. So let's print this list. Not list. And, then turn that. and again, so now we see that we have a list of integers. And this time there's no there's no quotations, right? Why is there no quotation of that? Because they are integer. Exactly, right. So again, strings are always inside of, of quotations. The other data types are not. So very, very good job. All right, so, and then we know these are integers because there's no little, there's no point, right? So do you guys think I could store floats? 22.5, and that's one down. So indeed a list could hold elements of different data types. So, and let's, let's further, um, let's further, uh, actually, so, uh, Let's see if we could even add strings on there. So yeah, so I think of a list as a container that holds elements. The elements elements refer to the things inside of the list, right? Um, and then it can hold elements of different types, meaning different data types. So in in like, as you guys can see here, um, we have one of each. We have uh, integer. We have a floating point, and we have each string. So. So let's become very powerful for things for things. 
uh, loops or just storing data, stuff like that. Pretty cool, some pretty cool stuff to be done with this. So let's just comment that out next one in case we want to come back to it. And then let's run uh, the program that I have. So, so this program kind of is going to make use of a for loop. So does anyone, can anyone who think what a for loop might be, or if you know what it is, can you come off you and tell us? Yeah, a uh, for loop iterates through an array or any set of data that you have until the end. Until the end, until for however long you say you want it to break, yes. And uh, so, so here I, uh, so profile is different from profile list. And if you look at it, it's also written differently. So this is what we call squarely brackets. And this is a whole different data type. It's called a dictionary in Python. And dictionaries are a mapping kind of um, data, data type. Basically, you use it to specifically say, hey, um, this, this is going to be in such and such place in memory or some kind of, that's kind of like the functional picture. It's kind of like, it's way beyond the scope for anything that you would need in the CompTIA, but um, I did have a nice little loop here that I want to show you guys. So I have these, I have these values up here. Each one is a, is a, is a key and then a value to it. So the key is actually the main and then the value would be whatever I have after the double colon. So I'm telling my for loop for any key for anything in blue up here, I want you to go ahead um, and print the key and then um, add a little nice little bit of string just to di differentiate and then print the value of the key. So and then so then print um, the actual value is whatever I have stored up here. So let's go ahead and run this. Um, and I don't want I don't want this to come. So I would expect to see something like name, Darwin Gomez, go, cyber ninja, stuff like that. And let's see if that's what comes. So what's not defined on the list? So you, um like I said, um you're gonna run into your share of errors. Um usually um the interpreter will tell you, hey, go go somewhere you have an error. Like right now, it told me I had an error in line 19. It was telling me that num list was not defined and indeed is not because I commented it out. So because of that, I was able to read that, go to the appropriate line and fix and, you know, and fix it. And and what I needed to do was just comment comment that out too. So I don't want that. So let's run it again. Okay, so so what happened was um, I have four, so I had four keys, right? Name, role, email, and go, and I wanted those printed out with their values next. And indeed, that's what happened. Um, I didn't get any more than four because why did I get any more than four? Because it's important. Because they were specifically four in it, so it it it's. It's like Andrew said, it iterated. So iteration means that something is performed uh, a certain amount of times. It iterated four times because I had four key value pairs in there. So that if I was to add another one, so like let's let's write uh, age, right? Well, I got to put that inside of there. So let's write age, and then uh, have to do that, and then age. And if I was to do this now, what do you guys expect different? How many, how many different, how many lines would you expect instead of four? Five. Five. Yes, that would be correct. It's not because now my now my data structure, my dictionary holds five key value pairs. In it, so you would expect five lines. So let's see. And indeed I did, I, I got five. So yeah. Um so for loops will iterate. Um, for as long as they are in range of whatever it is that you're trying to. So there is another file here. Uh, 
right. And this one is pretty cool. Uh, so this one is kind of, uh, let's, let's go ahead and clear our output. It's kind of, all right so here i got so what what is this here what do i have, what kind of data is this what kind of data structure is this here? a list yes a list. it's kind of it, it's it's kind of in the name of the variable so but yeah yeah so it's a list right it holds a certain amount of elements inside of square brackets so yeah that's what we would define as a list in python and then the second one, what is it? Also a list because it's in brackets. Yeah, good job, thank you. And they hold integers, right? They, they, we can all agree that they hold integers. So, um, okay, so I have some things that I wanna comment out for right now. How do I do that in here? What's my pro tip that I told you guys? Control backslash or? Back. Control yeah. for, forward slash. Control forward slash. Okay. Yes. Good job. So yeah, I, I commented all that stuff out. Um, so I have a I have some commands here. Just print list and then print list two, right? So I just expect to see these in my console down here. And indeed, that's what I get, right? Um, again, I the console is going to tell me that they're lists because they're inside of square square brackets. So then, um, so then I have a for loop down here. I'm gonna uncomment this right now. Uh, and for so right now I'm saying for i in list prints the list one value and go go get i, and then prints list two value, go get a go to list two and get x. And then after that I got something here called decrement, which is x minus one and then assign that value to x. So again, these are um a little bit beyond what you need for the CompTIA, but they do I I, I do want to iterate uh, show you what iteration is. So again, this is gonna be a for loop. So this in keyword is gonna is telling the program that uh that I gotta do the iteration a certain amount of times. So I gotta go into the first list. And then I have this I set to zero. So I set I to zero. So I right now is going to be value zero. And the reason I did that is to index it. So an index is a location inside of a data structure. So Uh, all right, so the index for the first index is always going to be zero. And then it will go up after that for each element. Trying to get it to line up. Okay. Hello. All right, so who could tell me what the value in list one would be at index three, based on what I told you? Four. Yes. The, in, the value of index three would be four. That's correct. Good job. Uh, Right, so you guys see how it kind of lines up? Wait, no, I don't understand how you got where right. that were. So in, in these kind of data structures, like a list, an index refers to the position of an element. 
So the first element being number one is at position zero or index zero. The number four, right, would be the would be at position three because we start at zero for indexing. So it'd be zero, one, two, and three. So if I if I tell the computer, go get me the value of index three, it will return whatever's there, which is the number four. And then it's it kind of it's kind of a little bit more intuitive in the second list, right? Like because there are a little more. Things. So think about it. Think about it like when we count in binary, they can they consider zero a number in the indexing process. So zero takes up a spot. And so if we're asking for the third, we still have to go to zero, one, two, three. Correct. Um, and then so so in here, what would be the value of index four? Five hundred. Five hundred. All right. Awesome. Okay. So so then I set these indexes down here to zero, i equals zero, and x equals four. And then I'm telling my loop that to go, you know, for every i in loop in in the list one, go and print its value, and then go to list two and print out the value of x. Right. And I set x as four. And then after that, I'm going to tell the computer to take whatever X is and subtract one from it, All right? So let's let's run this program and kind of see what this, what this looks like. All right, so the first, the first iteration or the first run through the loop, list one is going to be a value of one, right? It's going to be the first time. And list two is going to give me the last the last one because I told it to go to value four and print out that. So I got 500, right? And then now in list, so that was the first iteration. So then we, we, we go to the second iteration and now the value is two. So we're at value two, right? And we want to print um, X minus one, which would be three. And here, the value of three is 400. And so forth. So the third iteration. So the first list is increasing in value, and then the second one I'm decreasing the index, right? So I'm getting I'm increasing the index of the first one while decreasing the the values uh, the values of the second. And that's kind of like what a for, for loop would be. And then so the for loop ends once we reach the end of list one, which would be um, five. And indeed, we see that after five, we have no more. We have nothing else, right? Um, does it, so I'm decreasing, um, if I wanted this to look a little different, like if I wanted this to iterate, uh, from 100 all the way to 500, there's only two characters in the whole code that I would have to change. And, um, before I, before I give you guys the answer, does anyone want to take a, a crack at that? I, like which two characters I would change to have it. Um, have this iterate from 100 to 500 and increase. Plus? Plus where? Right here, where the, where the minus is on. So like this. That would be correct for one part of it. So there's one more character that I need to change. Change the four to zero. Yeah, it's the four to zero. That was very astute. So now I've said that X starts at zero and I want X to increase every time that the loop iterates, right? So let's go ahead and run that. And indeed, we, we got a totally new function for this loop by changing two characters, right? But that's because we have a little bit of understanding of the index of, the, of how we index um, these lists. I, which is the index for the first list and X, our second list, and we're basically saying um, every time that i increases, also increase x, and then put me the value of i, which is how we get one, two, three, four, five, one hundred, two hundred, three. And so, if I wanted to do it the other way, like I wanted to start from from four, actually, no, that's not right. So if I want to go back to the way I had it, again, all I have to do is change 
my index location, and then instead of adding it, I can, I can reverse it. Um, there are some other pretty cool things that you could do with lists. So, like there's like built-in functions. Like I can I can say list um, dot reverse, and I can um, and then I can say uh, print list. And let's print it the first time. So we're going to print. We're, we're going to print list one. Then we're going to reverse it, and then we'll print it again. And this is a this is some you know this is just a built-in function of someone who coded Python a long time ago, and they, they put this into into the list. So what happened was we we had the original list, which is one, two, three, four, five. Then I told Python, hey, go to list and just reverse reverse those those elements. And then finally, after that, I printed it, and, right? So I, pr I printed that list. And now that list is in itself is changed. So like if I was to do any, so if I was to take this, cut and paste it down here. So it's going to look completely different from how from when, from when it was the first time, right? So, because now the list is reversed. So, okay. So, it used to be one, two, three, four, five, right? But then I reversed, right? So now, because I have this little bit of code here with reverse, the entire list looks different. And so when I iterate through this program this time, I actually, have, you know, five is now at position where one is not at position. So that's kind of like the power of the reverse. And um, you can do that. Um, so a lot, so a lot of these like, Functions and uh, and data types have nice little methods that we can. So that's what this is called. This uh, this re reverse is called a method or a function. I think it's called a function in Python. Um, and basically, it's it has like some built-in functionality. So pretty cool. Um, yeah, that kind of like kind of what I wanted to show you about for the for loops they will iterate for as long as um as there's elements in the grid is trying to iterate through um and then the last one is the while loop so let's go ahead and comment this out. Uh, so let's go let and let's go equals true And then I'm gonna write do while let's So I made a mistake here. So whenever you're doing a while, uh, whenever you're doing like a conditional statement, you need to end it in a double colon in Python. Uh, so kind of like the, uh, the syntax. That's the you. That's the beauty of having a like uh, editor, something like VS Code or PyCharm. It'll highlight that for you. Kind of like spell check does in Word. Like if I was doing this on Notepad. I wouldn't know until I try to run it. I would be like, I get some kind of about it. Um, so the while, so the while, so the while loop will 
continue to to run um, while a condition is being met. So basically, I'm telling the I'm telling the the interpreter, hey, while whatever is inside of lit exactly matches true, I want you to print the following statement, which is this lesson is lit. And I did this. Is, so this is what we talked about earlier with the um, infinite uh, loop. And these are usually, these are bad. Um, I'm going to run this not on my the online header. And I'll, I'll just put the one for this not here. And what you guys will see is just so yeah. So it's just gonna it's gonna keep going on forever. So they have a they have a, a like a hard count on how long something can run on their on their compiler. So it'll stop at about after like 60 seconds. But if I ran this on my computer, it will take up resources as long until I finally go in and manually end it. Right. So I can end it here. And the process stop. Again, that would eventually online it would have been stopped. So um and um, but this is bad. Like I said earlier, what happens is that you hold up your resources indefinitely until you go ahead and actually fix it out. So that's why we want to try to avoid these kind of things. Whenever you're using a while, um, you want to make sure that um, that your condition only executes it when when you want it to. And so be very careful when, when doing this. Do some do a little bit more research on it if you can, and make sure you kind of like grasp it. Um, that's kind of it for what I wanted. What I wanted to teach you guys about these kind of things. Um, yes, go ahead. I whoever's trying to say something. I didn't hear anything. Oh, I, I thought I heard someone. So, um, uh, raise your hand if you're able to log on to this website, the online dot Okay. Um. All right, let me copy and paste it in. I want all of you guys to get on, please, if you can. <clears throat> oh, that's not what I wanted to put in there. Uh, so go ahead and click on that. There you go. Um, and then. Okay, um, that's not what I wanted. Oh, I saved it. That's kind of the problem sometimes. With, um... All right. All right, everybody get logged in real quick. Just take a minute. Are we just clicking on the link? Yeah, yeah, just, just click on the in. link. Just, 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 yeah. You don't even have to set up an account right now. Okay. Let me give, let me give you a link to my actual website. Um, if I can remember how to do it. Um, there it is. Okay. All right. So, and then copy this, or just click on that, or. And should you click on it, and then you should get access to everything that I have on this. So go to the last one, rename or whatever you want, and then all I want you to do is get this to print out your information. And then once you've done that, we are you're done. Get this to print out what? Their information. So I want them. So this message. 
So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hold on, we have an error. Let's figure it out. So name is not defined. Okay, so somehow, okay, so fix the error. So define the variable name and put in whatever name we want. And let's see if that works. So yeah, I want this. I want this to print out your information. So there's there's about five things. Just quick modifies. Yeah. So let's find yourself. Give me any stuff. Oh sure, I see a lot of reasons. Uh, oh, this is just from when I actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Bring your then, hands in. Yeah, and then when you uh, once you got it to run uh, successfully. Just give me a thumbs up or a select confetti or something like that. Let me know that you're good. <laughs> Why am I being advertised to box? On my work account. I have no idea, dude. That's hilarious. It's like I'm the being, uh, the I'm being advertised the, optimum business fiber and then bras. The, the that's a, that's v, a very very interesting combination. Yeah, right. But like it was like the VMs on Coursera. You'd always get really weird advertisements on those. Yeah. And those are virtual machines that were getting spun up. <laughs> like had nothing to do with you. <laughs> So. All right, is anybody able to do it? Oh, we got a few, I guess. Jamal and Andrew, you were, you were able to get it done? Uh, no, I'm still doing it. My hand was just up for the initial. Hand. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got it. All right, cool, Andrew. All right, pretty cool stuff. Um, so I take it that you've had some experience before a little coding. Room. Yeah. All right, cool. So yeah, um, is is there anything that I that I went over that you didn't uh, experience before? Pretty really much all the basic you said to you. Um, for me, and the the basics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Is there anything that you would want to tell them that I didn't go over? That I kind of our condensed time, a lot of goals. So. Um, yeah, it's like the first 12 lessons in Python condensed into one. <laughs> um, if anything, just continuing off the if statements, um, you could do if else, just like to continue it if they want everything to happen. Uh, you mean LF? Oh, well, I don't use Python, so I use a lot. Of yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. In like uh, in Java or JavaScript, it's if else. But in, um, so like, so in Python, it's elif. So uh, elif, um, if here um, equals true and, and decimal 1.5. Five, let's say print something like print. Okay, so so what which were so yeah so so if statements you can you kind of you can kind of do them uh, into more complicated ones basically saying if something if something is true do this um, elif if something if there's a different condition do do this so that means else if do something else and then else would be the case where nothing that you have above is executing and this is just your your um, your statement. Um, so yeah, so they can get pretty complicated. Um, I don't even know if I wrote this correctly. Let's see. Mm. 
so here is zero. Okay, so so here is zero, so it's not true. So the first one is not getting printed, and the second one is not getting printed because true it's not true. And uh, so while decimal is true and it equals one point five, the first one is not true. So both of these need to um, be uh, so both of these need to be true in order for the entire um, statement to, to 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 express. So again, uh, these are for uh, uh, the elif or the else if would be conditional statements when you want to um, have multiple um, kind of like conditions and then have have different uh, code running instead of just being one or two. And you could you could have a ton of you get seven hundred and fifty. You have three of them, and you can you know at minimum it would be two like that. Very minimum. powerful data for data management. Yeah. Yeah, and again, uh, so so many of these things that we did were kind of like uh, like trivial in the sense of like we're doing it um, as a tutorial. But yeah, so they become very popular, like very powerful when you're trying to you know, get programs to do certain tasks, um, siph siphon through data, siphon um, anything that take a normal person a long time to get. You can write code and programs to do that those things for us. Yeah, and then that kind of like brings me to the end of it. I don't know if there's anything else that you guys have questions for me. Please feel free to ask. Um, if you're first learning about, if you're first learning about this now, um, and you think it's something that you want to get into, I definitely recommend uh, this website that we're on right now to like write some small scripts, uh, write some like small little programming, and then once you once you're like, yeah, I want to do that, then you can go and download it. I need interpreter with that. And then you can start building a portfolio and stuff for yourself so that you can kind of showcase your yeah. little programs, whatever. It works really wonderfully on your resume and stuff like that. So, um, yes. So, yeah, that brings me to the end of it. Uh, Andre did it. I'm self taught off it for two days before I learned it. Yeah, and uh, you can I also use CodePen. For those people that use Java, um, JavaScript, it's HTML and everything else. It's really good. It's free. It's like online Python and stuff. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I this one, uh, I have one that does Java and JavaScript, but I don't remember the name of it. It's on my other, my other Google Google profile. Yeah. So what is it? What's the name of it? Again? Quick pen. Um, quick pen. So yeah, I always love hearing about new tools because the, oh. the, the thing of code pen, not quick pen, sorry. Code C O D E. Like that? So no, code. code, code pen. I'm sorry. I yeah. It's all right. Okay. Here. Is this what it looks like? You can use you. You can use. They use a lot of uh, Java HTML, like front end type type of stuff. You can also do back end too. They use Kotlin, Vue, and, and a lot of different stuff, which is good. Yeah, awesome. So the so the moral story is there's a lot of different things out there, and um, like I like we said earlier, try try new things out. See what works out for you. Which one you're more comfortable with? Um, do some if it's something that you like. Maybe something that you can see as being useful to you and your, you know, your career or for fun. You know, do a little bit more research into it and see where it takes you. So yeah, so um, kind of like tying that back up into the lesson. This kind of like tells us that now we should uh, understand what shell scripts are, the basic of how to write these scripts, the difference between a Windows script, a JavaScript, a Python script, um, and then the use cases for them, and then things to consider like safety and best practice. All right. So if, unless you have any questions for me, that is it. And 